Oh, is this thing on? Hello, hello? Oh, it, it looks like it's on. Oh, it, and it looks like you can hear me. Fantastic. Pog champ. It's a pog champ, boys. Alrighty, uh, I, we gotta make an announcement. If you don't know already, we have a wonderful Discord with a wonderful group of people, and we'd like for you to be a part of it. Yes, you, listening right now. Be sure to check it out if you haven't already in the About section to get a link to an invite link to the Discord. We're implementing floats. Pog, pog. All right, that's all looking nice. Fantastic. All righty. But yeah, be sure to check out the Discord if you haven't already. There's announcements every time I go live. There's a, you can post stuff. You can get help with things. There's all sorts of stuff. Post memes and off topic. Whatever you want. You, you, we do it all. I'd say that we, uh, we're going to have a busy day today. So let's get cracking. I kind of got interested in this when I was sick recently. And I was watching, binge watching YouTube and laying in bed. And one thing I noticed was that... We're going to start with a little build build file here. One thing I noticed was that I didn't know how floating point numbers work. I just kind of, they seemed like black magic and they're kind of under the surface and it, they seem like too, too hard to even understand. And there's even like specialized hardware in order to truthfully, uh, Oh, I fixed my chat. There we go. There's like specialized hardware to calculate floating point math. So it's like, it seems so impossible to ever comprehend, but I think I've got it. I think I watched enough YouTube videos <laughs> to get it. Honestly, it was pretty easy once I realized that floating point numbers are actually just scientific notation numbers. That makes it so much easier to understand, at least from my perspective. It might get bright here. Boink. So in C, if we look at the C data types, here I'll, I'll pop that in chat in case you want to look, follow along. If we look at float and double and long double, we can see that float is a single precision floating point type, and it's a, uh, on most systems, an IEEE, -E -E, IEEE, 754 single precision binary floating point format number. And if we look into what that is, we can see that it's basically a float32. It's a computer number format that occupies 32 bits in memory, and it can represent a wide range of numbers. But how does it represent this wide range of numbers if there aren't even that many numbers in that range? Right? In 32 bits. So it, it uses some cool tricks. So the binary 32 is the name of the actual uh, standard. And it has one sign bit, eight exponent bits, and 24 significant bits. And you'll notice that adds up to 33 because only 23 of the significant, or the mantissa, is explicitly stored. <laughs> also, what's up, Sarade? Moly the Man, Zarias, thank you all so much for tuning in. It is great to see you all. I'm so glad to have you. Uh, so we're going to have a new project. I think I'm just going to call it mantissa or something like that, because that's a cool word, right? And do I need to do version... Usually you do languages. We're going to do C++ in this one. And of course, before every project, you need a C make minimum required. I'm just going to choose like pi, because why not? 
We're going to add an executable with source slash main.c. This is probably not going to be uh, for long. This is going to be for testing and initial development. It'll eventually be a library, I'm sure. But it's much easier to run an executable and then convert it into a library, which is quite easy. With that, I think we just have to make... Uh, also, I didn't do that, right? There we go. Make this and start. And let's just do something like this to make sure everything's working. That looks good. I think I can do this. Uh, yeah, we'll just start a new shell. 2023, Mantissa, perfect. And basically, we're going to just make a basic, basically, basic. We're just going to let CMake generate something. Oh, it says the target name. Oh, yeah, it might be important to actually name <laughs> the thing that we're adding. So let's name it also Mantissa. That's better. Then we can just build and clean first. And it lo it worked. Then we can do build slash mantissa. And it works. And we can echo the last exit code and it's zero. We can ensure that whole system works. Pog. We got 69 out. We did it. <laughs> okay. We're done. Floating point number is implemented. Uh, we are in C++ because I think I'm going to implement this in sort of a an, an abstract way. I don't know if I even need to do it this way, but I've just been thinking about it in this way, and I think it's going to be fun to try. So, let's try. Let us try. I think that we should start with defining the basic structure. So we're going to have a struct, which is our like float implementation, right? And we're going to have a U32 for binary 32. That should be all we need. Zarias? I missed a, a chat. I watched a vid about how GPU works. <laughs> ah, and he explained a lot of floating number, floating point numbers thingies. Hopefully this will help with that then. And this is basically the representation, right? And out of this, we're going to get like little accessors that also return U32. And then I think we're going to do some const expert funness with a const. I guess I can't use a U32 technically. I got to do this type of thing and do UN32T. I guess I could do pretty quick this or some C++ness. This is going to be our sign mask, right? And this is going to be one to the left, 31, pretty much. A better way, we might just want to write, I know this sounds crazy, we might just want to write that many zeros. Does that work? No? Okay. In C++, we now have... Uh, separators as well. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. Eight times four is 32. Turn off line wrapping. And then we just want this top bit set. Then we can just do the exponent mask, which if we take a look is the next eight bits. So it's not this bit. 
and it's three, four, three, four. There's the next eight bits. We can even line these up nicely. And then we can do our mantissa. And this is going to be the rest of the bits. Whoops, not sure what I did there. And I can probably do something crazy like this. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. <laughs> okay. Azaria says, had the same thought when I saw Flow Dimple, to be honest. <laughs> Rosuk says, wow, rust. <laughs> sure. Uh, we can initialize this, just so it's a zeroed. And we just need the representation ended with the sign mask, right? And the sign may be better as a negative getter that is a bool. So we can return representation and sign mask, which would mean that if it's non-zero, this is uh, true, because this would be negative because the sign bit is set, which means it's negative. Beautiful stuff. We can now get the exponent. You would think in the same way, just by doing this. Because I guess uh, I should also explain, once we get this down, how these all interact. So we have this exponent. And that seems all fine and dandy. But the key is that the exponent has a zero offset of 127. So the bias is what they call it, is 127. So we can just add that up here. Uh, sure, exponent bias, 127. So whatever we store here, is actually going to be plus 127, whatever the actual exponent is, as far as I know. Is that correct? Yeah. Because, and then this will, uh, this will actually be a signed uh, byte. Signed eight. also known as a char in some circumstances, but not all. So that's our exponent bias, and it goes from what appears to be negative 126 up to 127. So that seems to be good. And then, and also we don't have to use that there. Then we should be looking at getting out our... It may be smarter just to have this as a U32 and get the raw bits out and then have a helper to get the actual exponent, but we'll see. Now we would like the mantissa. Now the mantissa just refers to the fraction, which is basically the decimal part of the number. And in scientific notation, if you don't know, scientific notation, let's look that up. I don't know how to describe it, but I'm sure Wikipedia does. Is there a difference between define SA int 80 and using SA80? Uh, not really. One of them is just using C++'s internal design with the using. The other one uses the C preprocessor. There's no real difference other than that C++ is aware of one more than the other and how it uh, falls through to the other type for valid type checking. So as you can see, the number 2 can be described in scientific notation as 2 times 10 to the 0th power, because 10 to the 0th power, anything to the 0th power for that matter, is 1. So 2 times 1 is 2. 3 times 10 to the second power is 300. Now the reason that this becomes 3 and 10 to the second power, 10 to the second power is 10 times 10, which is 100. So 3 times 100 is obviously 300. 
And it becomes more clear what we're actually doing with this notation in this scenario, where we have 4,321.768. And in scientific notation, it's 4.321768 times 10 to the third power. Now, because multiplying by the base of the number to a power is the same as moving the decimal that many digits, we can basically say that because we're multiplying by 10 to the third power, this will actually just move three points over. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, DNs, you're very helpful. <laughs> so as you can see, two is two times 10 to the zero, 300, three times 10 to the second. Here's the crazy number, 4321768. And you can see that the decimal just moves three over, and that's coincidentally, maybe not so coincidentally, also the number here. And you can see a negative 53,000, we have negative 5.3 times 10 to the four. And if we move this decimal point four places to the right, then we would get this number once again. Cool, huh? So this scientific notation lets us write any number as a single digit, a decimal point, and then a fraction multiplied by the number base times some power. So this exponent in scientific notation is what we're actually storing in this exponent mask area. And this uh, fraction, this decimal, portion of the number is what we're storing in the mantissa. And because it's binary, there is an implicit leading one, which is why there are actually uh, 24 bits, but only 23 stored, because the first leading one in binary, it can only be 0 or 1, so they just chose 1, except for subnormal numbers, but don't worry about that yet. So it's going to be 1 dot the mantissa if that makes sense, times 2 to the exponent because we're, these numbers are in base 2. Hopefully that makes any amount of sense. Let's go for it. So this we can return representation and mantissimask. And there's actually something very interesting that we didn't do because this number is actually up here. So we need to shift it this many bits, which is for 23 bits, right? And we can probably also just write all those down. So we'll have sine bit full 31. So this is like the number, uh, the bit offset that it starts at, what you would shift by one to get to this bit or range of bits. And I think that's 23. And then we would have the mantissa bit, which is zero, which we don't truthfully need, but we may need. And I guess we don't need it. We don't need it because the mantissa will always be at the, the rest of the bits on the right side, I'm pretty sure. At least that's what we're going to assume today. So one thing that we didn't do is actually shift the exponent, which is why we needed to do that, because these eight bits have been masked out, but then we need to move them to the first eight bits. That way it's properly will fit in this signed eight integer and we can minus 127 properly. Hopefully that works out. And then the mantissa, which is just representation and mantissa mask because we just need these bits. That should be fine. Okay, well, this seems like we're beginning to be at a valid place where this will actually work. Let's try and create one and just say foo. And we're not going to try and do anything. We're just going to make sure it compiles. It compiles. Everything went fine. It returns zero. Boggers. Ba -ba -ba Boggers. Which means we can keep going.
So what would we actually like to do? First of all, we'd like to be able to, I guess one thing we'd like to do is print the number out in decimal form, which is gonna be kind of rough, but I think we can manage. Another thing we would like to do is to be able to add two of these floats together. And another thing we'd like to do is be able to construct them easily from C++ floats, like 2.1f, because it would be cool to just have that be possible and not have to worry about figuring out the exponent and mantis and sign bit of everything we want to do manually. Now, luckily, because we started at the C data types, C++ uses this same floating point format for its float. So C and C++, if you type float, this is what you get, which means that we should be able to just pass in a float and get the valid thing back out, represented here with the valid exponent mantis and negative able to be extracted from it. So let's see if this works, I guess. I guess, it would not see if this works, but uh, see how we have to do this, because how do we actually get a U32 of our float here? I'm pretty sure we're going to have to use a reinterpret cast, aren't we? So if we reinterpret cast, we don't need that into a U32 from F, you'd think that would work, but I believe it's going to give us an error. What do we get here? Let's make this a little, a little wider. We get failed because invalid cast from type float to type U32. So this doesn't work. What we're going to have to do, as Serrate has, has already gotten there, right? So we cast this to a pointer, a U32 pointer, and then we dereference it. And we do the address of F. So we take wherever F is in memory, we treat it as a U32 pointer, and then we read a U32 from there into our representation. And if we do this, <laughs> it didn't quite work. What I do wrong? No matching function for call to, oh, I didn't make a default constructor. That would be my fault. Lol. Pog, it works. And still returns zero. So it seems like everything has worked. And then we can also do a little test. And I know I'm, uh, I hate it, but just as much as everyone here, but we're going to use IO stream, sadly. And I'm just going to do this thing. Uh, Mortal sense C++ allows punctuation inside int literals. Didn't know that, Pog. Yep, it allows the quote, single quote character. Has no member names. Ah, I named it negative. I forgot I changed the name. Is it negative? We get a zero. Okay, now what if we make it negative? We get a one. <laughs> Pog champ, boys. You can also just use lib format instead. Yeah, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna deal with that. But we got. We we can actually decode a floating point number now. And we could do something even like this. This is so bad. <laughs> I hate, I hate IO streams. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be, okay. So this is kind of where this is going to go wrong, but this is a good example. Okay, what do we have here? Jesus. Negative space. Mantissa. 
So we actually are going to need here one dot and then the mantissa because of the implicit leading one that isn't stored. And then we're going to need times two to the sum power, which is the exponent, and then new line. Sure. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Naturally. Okay. Uh, mainly, the issue would be, I guess it wants to be here. If I go to regular mode, a little less colorful, but it'll do that properly. So it seems like, A, the mantissa is not correct, because that's not right. And then that's not a printable character, because I think this is just the literal number, and it's not the actual printable character. Hmm. So to actually get the number... Oh, man. I don't remember how to do this with IO streams, to be honest. How do you actually get like the uh, the character representation, like the digits of the number? Am I making any sense? Because like this is the value one. How do we get the number one from that? I don't remember in in this. Because we're pro this is probably a, just a type def to like a a, a char. But a char value of 1 isn't printable, or whatever this exponent is. Which is probably 1. I should just use lib format instead. Cast it to literally any integer type that isn't a char. Okay, pog. I guess I still want to tell if it's negative. Thank you, Sir Aid. I don't know what I'd do without you. <laughs> Okay, this is better. So we can see that we have, uh, it's not negative, and we have 1.419430. I don't think this is correct, because I'm not printing it properly. Oh, 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 I know what's going wrong. And then we multiply that by 2 to the 1. Well, that's closer, because the actual scientific notation of 2.1 is going to be in binary, I guess it's going to be complicated because 0.1 isn't really a, a good one to have. But if we did 0.375, see the thing with 0.375 is that 2 in binary is actually just 10, right? So 2 in decimal is 10 in binary, if that makes sense because the bottom bit refers to zero, it refers to one, the second bit, or first bit, depending on how you count things, zero with first bit. The first bit refers to twos, and there's one two, which makes two, and that is all we need, so we have 10. And then 0.375, if you don't know, to get a, to convert the base of any fraction like this, you just take the fraction part, you ignore the 2, the integer part, take the fraction part and multiply it by your base, right? So this 2 here is our number base because we're working in binary and want to convert it to base 2. And then that equals 0 0.75, right? 0.375 times 2. This 0, right, this is actually a digit in the binary number result. So let's keep doing this, and then we go until we get a zero as our decimal point. So 0.75 times 2 is equal to 1.5. This 1 is another digit. And then we have 0.5 times 2, which is equal to 1.0. Now we have zero. This is our stopping point. And then we have 1 again, which we pop into our final point and we now have because we have zero we reached our stopping point the binary representation of 0.375 is 0 0.011 and because we know that 2 is in binary is actually 10 10.011 is equal 
to 2.375 in decimal. Does that make sense? <laughs> Hopefully that makes sense. And this is uh, nearly the inverse of what you do when you actually print a number, which is why the mantissa is wrong, because the number is stored in this format, but it's being treated like it's an integer whole. But we need to actually treat it like it's these, which means that it's going to be rough. <laughs> I think it's going to be it's going to be fine, but I think we can do it. I think it'll be a good challenge. Let's just do like this. Right? Let's have a string and say mantissa string. And we're going to say u32 mantissa equals mantissa. This is fine, right? Why is this freaking out? Oh, because I named it the same thing. Mantissa, sure. And we're going to have a standard string. Ooh, if we use C20, I could just use standard format. Interesting. Uh, return out. And then I'm going to say while mantissa, because zero is our ending point, right? Ooh, another thing we should do with the mantissa is probably want to set that leading bit. So we're going to or this with one left to the exponent bit, which will set this, uh, this bit here, which means we will actually get the one dot blah, 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 mantissa. So we'll get the full bits. Okay, sure. So I think we have while mantissa, we're going to basically have out plus equals Interesting. So I think what we're actually going to be doing is kind of this thing, but for decimal, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah, multiplication works both ways. This will, this will work. So we have 0 0.011 in binary, and we actually want to get this now to 2 dot to 0.375, right? And to do this in decimal, to be clear, to do this, we're going to have to take 0 0.011, multiply it by 10, our number base, right? And then we're going to have to have that equal some binary number dot more bits, right? <laughs> I don't know what the answer is to that, but uh, is it literally 0.11? I don't know. It's probably 0.11. Don't worry about that. 0 0.11. And then this is going to be our digit because multiplying by 10 may possibly get us up to 10 dot something. We will see. We will see. So it says standard format isn't really supported yet, except in some versions of MSVC. Yeah, that's true. We'd ha I'd have to like get GCC trunk. <laughs> uh, what do I do here? So basically, we're going to multiply by our number base that we want to convert into. And we can even have this be like an int. Uh, sure, why not U32, why not? <laughs> and base will equal 10, right? We multiply it by base, and then we want to extract out the bits above the decimal, which is the exponent bit. So we almost want to do 
mantissa and exponent mask to the right exponent bit. Okay, hear me out. So the exponent is everything above the fraction part, yeah? So everything above the dot, right, the dot, the decimal is effectively here. So everything above that is only because we've multiplied by 10. So everything up here, right, is only because we've multiplied by 10. So because of that, we now need to take the stuff here, shift it to the right to get it the bottom, to get it at the bottom, 8 bits. And then we need to use that to get a, <laughs> this is insane. We're gonna use that to get a digit. Also, I think we have to unset this bit, which is kind of ironic. So we're gonna do mantissa no leading. And we're just gonna not have that. And then this is gonna be, there we go, a little bit of that. Okay. Because we don't want any leading digit. We don't want a 1 here. Because that means that this could be over 10 and then this wouldn't work. So we're actually going to have out plus equals 0 plus this. <laughs> I feel insane, but I hope this works. If it doesn't, it's going to be quite embarrassing, I admit. So while mantissa, mantissa times equals 10, out plus equals blah, mantissa and equals mantissa mask. So this is getting rid of all these bits that we're checking here. And then that's how it'll keep getting smaller. Okay. No infinite loop, go burr. Let's do this. <laughs> well, that's closer than I thought it was going to be. What did I get? 1.1875 times 2 to the 1. Wait, that's right. Does anybody have Python open? Can you guess and check this? Is that correct? Does Google work? Google does work. Oh! Chat. <laughs> Chat. <laughs> Look at that number. Okay, we are effectively decoding a floating point number from C++. PogChamp. PogChamp. How cool is that? How cool is that? We should probably also just have like a regular representation, which I can't call that. In case we want to like do something raw, and then we should also have like, if it's negative, the exponent and the mantissa. And then for this, interestingly enough, we don't really have great ways to set these things. So I think we should do that. So we're going to do something like this, and we're going to say representation and equals not sign mask. So what this will do is clear the bit that is set in the sign mask, the top one. And then we're going to say if is negative representation or equals uh, one left to the sign bit. We could also do is negative to the left sign bit. 
I feel like this is also fine. Yeah? And this doesn't need to return anything. Let's do the same thing for exponent. This one will be especially nice because there's a lot of stuff that needs done for the exponent. So we'd like to clear the exponent mask. And then we would like to set the bits. To what? Okay, so we have an exponent, but it's actually at an, uh, a bias, right? The bias 127, the exponent bias. So this exponent bias, we're going to have to add to the exponent. I think that makes sense. But here's the thing. And this is because the bias refers to the offset uh, at which zero is. So zero in this exponent is 127. So if we pass in zero, we want this to actually be 127 as a number here. We may want to do something like this uh, to properly just convert everything. That way we're not doing uh, worry about overflow or underflow of the signed integer. Anyway, this isn't enough because if we just add these bits, they'll be over at the right here, and we actually need them up here at the exponent mask offset by the exponent bit. So that is what we will be doing. Shift them to the left by the exponent bit to get the bits in the proper spot. And with that, how do we get the exponent? To get the exponent, it's a bit messy. We and it with the mask. Ooh, okay, yep. We put it to the right with the bits and then minus the bias. So in reverse order, right, we add the bias. We shift it to the right, aka the left bits to reverse it. And then we actually have to and it in, in case uh, an invalid exponent is given. We can't really, this will never matter, but it's fine. It'll just make sure that only these bits are set in this OR. And then that is our set exponent. Okay, and there should be one more. This is probably a bad way to organize things, not gonna lie. We're gonna have set mantissa, which is gonna be quite simple because it's going to be representation and equals not mantissa mask. Oops. And then representation or equals, you've seen this before, mantissa and mantissa mask. Okay, so we now have a way to set the mantissa, the exponent and the negative bit, I would hope. So when we set the negative bit, we take the representation that we have, the underlying representation, and then we clear the sign bit, and then if it's negative, we set the sign bit. I think that's fine. To set the exponent, we clear the exponent, and then we add the exponent bias, shift it to the left by exponent bits, and then make sure that we only have those bits being set, and then the mantis is much simpler, just make sure it's within the mask and set those bits after clearing them. I think this all makes sense. Now we can have like a, a generic set, right? With is negative exponent and mantissa all in one. And it's basically just gonna say Set negative is negative. Set exponent, exponent. Set mantissa, mantissa. Right, that's fine with me. And then we can just use this here as well in our little constructor. Pog. So we're now getting the floating point uh, format. We're decoding it. We're converting it from C's floating point format, so that's fun. 
C and C++ is. What would be cool now is to add them, I would think. So let's try adding them, right? We're going to print out foo. We're going to print out bar. And then we're going to say sum. And then we're going to print out this other thing, which is sum. And sum is, I think, actually, I think we're going to maybe implement it like this. So instead of getting a new float, we just kind of alter one to address. I don't know. Let's, let's make it like this. And we're just going to say who plus bar. And we're going to have to implement this operator, which returns a float impl. And I think takes this. Correct me if I'm wrong, sorry. Is this the signature for the binary plus? Is the this implicit? Do I just have to pass the right-hand side because this is a member function? So I just need to do... this, basically. If you want it to be a member, just declare it with one arg. So, and then I just basically copy myself. How do I actually... So should this alter, is this like a to address add? Am I freaking out? <laughs> I have to return something here, right? So it's going to equal like this, right? Do I do, I do this? This seems like a kind of messy. We'll see. We'll see. We'll start with this. So we want to add two things. That did make this shush up. You can also make it a free fun a free function or a friend. Interesting. So a free function would be this, I think. If my C knowledge is up to snuff. And out would be some new number. Like this. Perfect. Lazy with the CPP reference link. Beautiful stuff. Well, this is cool. Uh, so now, what would we like to do? We would like to figure out how to add two numbers. And that may seem complicated, but it's actually just scientific notation, right? So how do you add scientific notation? Rewrite the numbers to have the same power. OK. So we need to say while of ten side exponent. I don't know why it's off the side of the screen, but it is. Exponent is less than right hand side exponent. Then I believe we should increase left hand side exponent. But to do this, we also have to adjust the mantissa because 2 times 10 to the first power, right, is 2 times 10, aka 20 in decimal. And if we wanted to say 0.2 times 10 to, or <laughs> I guess I, I spoiled it. If we wanted to say something times 10 to the second is equal to 20 in decimal, because we have increased the exponent, we're multiplying by a larger number, so the left side of the multiplication have to, has to get smaller, which means that 2.0 becomes 0 0.20. The decimal moves over by the amount the exponent increased. So these are both equal to 20 in decimal, right? 2 times 10 to the first power is 2 times 10. 
0.2 times 10 to the second power is 100 times 0.2, which is 20. They're the same, right? So this is effectively what we're doing here. We have to increase the left-hand side exponent until it equals the right-hand side exponent, if it needs increased. So to increase the exponent, uh, I guess really what we need to do is say new exponent, which is going to equal the left-hand side exponent, I guess. Sure. Why is this mad? Can these not be const? Oh, do I have to mark this as const? Do -do -do -do. These are all const. And this one too. You happy? Happy. Serade says, I'd just pass the fuimple by value to plus since they're small structs, in which case you can also make it a member, take a fuimple by value and modify that and return it. Make it a member, take a fuimple by value, modify that and return it. I like your thinking. Sure. We'll switch up one more time. <laughs> so take a float impl uh, value. So this will be what we return. And sure. So while basically we're first going to increase well see the reason that's a problem is because we also may need to change this one that's not going to work sorry <laughs> i do appreciate it though because we may need to change both sides or at least we need to change one side but we don't know which because we need to increase the exponent to match okay that's fine Oh, but basically, we need to increase the exponent of the left-hand side, which I guess means we just kind of need to do this. Since they're small structs, it doesn't matter. Increase exponents of either side until they match. Hopefully that makes sense. So we increase the left-hand side exponent, which means that the... left-hand side exponent is just going to be increased by one. And then the left-hand side mantissa this is an interesting one. So the mantissa is actually going to need to be set to Yeah, 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 yeah. So basically the left-hand side mantissa is going to need to be bit shifted Okay, hold on. This helps me. So the mantissa is this portion. So when we up this, the mantissa effectively gains the digit on the left of the dot in binary, right? In binary, everything is one dot blah, 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 blah. So the one is the only thing that can be the leading digit, which means that when we shift this to the right, then it would be the same as that. Okay. Sure. 
So this is effectively dividing and this is multiplying, right? This means multiply by two and then this divides the actual value we're storing by two to properly get the thing. And do we actually need to set? Yeah, I think that's how that works. I think. And then we have to do this the other way in case we need the right hand side increased. The right hand side is less than the left hand side. Set the right hand side. Basically, just do the same thing. A uh, vegan, 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 vegan asks You're making your own language? I am making my own programming language. It's called Intercept. I'm not working on it right now directly. This may end up being used by Intercept and stuff, but I'm not. I'm writing in C++ right now. Implementing floating point numbers from scratch. And we are already able to take floating point numbers from C, decode them, and print out the scientific notation that they represent in decimal. And this number is actually equal to, whoops, that's the wrong browser window, is actually equal to 2.375, which we had in here earlier. It's not there now. <laughs> I haven't run this recently. As you can see, if we get this number, also rounding, you can see it's very near 2.1, which is this number as close as you can get to 2.1 with an even bottom bit. But yeah, as you can see, we're actually able to decode the floating, the scientific notation from the floating point numbers given in C, and then uh, we're about to be able to add them. So yeah, hopefully that is cool. So we increase the exponent of either side That didn't work. One dot nothing times two to the negative 127. <laughs> oh God. Uh, so basically, while the left hand side exponent is less than the right hand side, set the exponent to the exponent plus one. While the left hand side, yep, and then make the mantissa one over, sure. Uh, I see you use DDG, a person of culture. I don't know what that is. What is DDG? <laughs> I just had a panic because I looked at the window that I paused at the uh, beginning of the stream and it it had the beginning of the stream. Oh, duck, duck, go. Yes, I do. That I do use that. I forget that I use that, but I do use that. Okay, so now that we've matched the exponents, let's look at our silly little chart here. Uh... Add or subtract the numbers. <laughs> That's a difficult one, huh? So now, these mantissas, because these exponents are now equal, the mantissas should now be able to be added or subtracted to get our result properly. So we can now do u32 new mantissa is equal to left-hand side mantissa plus right-hand side mantissa, and it's important that this is with the leading bit. And if you can imagine, what we're kind of doing here is if we had like 2 times 10 to the 0th power plus 4 times 10 to the 0th power, right? This is going to be equal to 6 times 10 to the 0th power because two plus four is six. And multiplying by the same thing means that we can just add up the coefficients the same way that you do when you're uh, in algebra, where you can merge alike factors. So now, imagine that we had eight times 10 to the zero plus four times 10 to the zero, that's actually going to equal 12 times 10 to the zero. And this is fine, that's a number, that's 12, but truthfully this isn't in 
a normalized form because there is a number greater than the uh, this number, greater than or equal to this number on the left-hand side, which is not really supposed to be in a normalized form. So to do that, we can do our little uh, bit shift, our little decimal shifting trick with the exponent. Again, on the answer, right? So on the answer, we can then do 1.2 times 10. And because this is now a smaller number, 1.2 versus 12, we need to multiply it by 10 to get to 12. So we add 110 multiplication to this, which means we now have 1.2 times 10 to the 1. So 8 times 10 to the 0 plus 4 times 10 to the 0 is actually 1.2 times 10 to the 1 in scientific notation format. That's what we're going to do now here. So our new mantissa, because of how addition works, we will basically have uh, some amount of numbers, right? So we're basically going to have some amount of numbers dot some amount of numbers, right? There's actually 23 here and then any amount here. There may just be one, there may be a bunch. And we need to get it into a format where there is the leading one has the decimal next to it. So we need to move this three, which means that we need to change the exponent, etc., etc. So let's begin doing that. This new mantissa is going to have some value that is basically the extra. I don't know how to say this properly. And the new mantissa and the exponent mask well, and not mantissa mask is a better way to put this, right? So everything except the actual stored mantissa is extra. And then we need to say if this extra stuff, well, we need to say while this extra stuff. So we actually need to do this in a while loop. Okay. Why is this? Oh, because I didn't, this isn't defined as a member. Hmm. I'm trying to think about how to fix this. It should just be a member or we should make the masks available as const expert functions on the struct. I don't really like that. I guess they're already static, right? Hmm, let's think about this. So I don't think I need that or that yet. I have to figure out the signs, I guess, as well. To do handle signs. Because some a negative number plus a negative number is the same. Well, any number plus a negative number. Right? If the right hand side, if one of them is negative, then that means you can kind of just frame it as a subtraction. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to handle signs. We'll have to handle signs. That's something we'll have to do. For now, I am just going to do this, but we'll probably have to fix that uh, eventually. So while there are bits set that are outside of the range that's actually allowed, and actually there's a hidden bit that is allowed, so while this is actually greater than one, because the first bit is actually the hidden bit and that's allowed to be set and actually needs to be set, so while there is a bit greater than one set in this shifted thing, okay, we need exponent bit now, 
<laughs> yes. Okay, so while this thing, which effectively is just, oh, it's a mess, but effectively we take the new mantissa, we check whatever the number past the decimal is above it, right? Whatever the whole number is, which is going to be some amount of bits. We shift that to the right to actually get that number, right? Not that number over to the left on in memory. We don't need that number up here in these ones. We need it down here. So we shift that over. And then if that's greater than one, because there's actually one bit allowed to be set, right? If that's greater than one, then we need to do this thing where we divide the mantissa by the base and add one to the exponent. So we can have signed a new exponent, which is going to equal to the exponent of both of them because the left-hand side and right-hand side have equalized exponents. Which we could even make this a member function. Equalize exponents to the largest exponent. Uh, da, 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 da. So the new exponent is going to get bigger while the new mantissa, and instead of dividing by our base, we can actually shift, bit shift, because our base is 2 in binary, and bit shifting is the same as dividing by 2 because of that rule. We can use it. So we can say bit shift it to the Let's see, yeah, bit shift it to the right by one. Return. Uh, something like this. Oops. Okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Oh, uh, chat. Chat. What do you think this number equals? <laughs> Wait a second. Did I do it? Oh, PogChamp. It's nearly 4.2. <laughs> nearly 4.2. <laughs> So the real question is what happens if we do the reverse cast? So if we cast the address of sum into a float pointer and then dereference that, can we now print that out? And see what we get. Oh. <laughs> Chat. Fogger. We did it. We did it. We just added 2.1 and 2.1 floating point numbers according to the IEEE 754 standard ourselves. <laughs> we don't need no XMM registers, okay? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Very cool. Uh, that's awesome. We can now add two numbers. So let's do something crazy and make one of them negative. That's not quite the right answer, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, 
Hmm. What do we do when we have a negative one? So if we have the left-hand side as negative, that means mantissa is going to be negative because a negative number to like negative two in decimal is equal to negative two times 10 to the zero or something like that, right? So the, the sign actually applies to the mantissa. So if we have... So I wonder if we actually need to set the sign bit in this U32 based on the sign bit. Let's think about this. So if the right hand side is negative, we can simply do left hand side minus right hand side because adding a negative number is the same as just subtracting the number, right? If the left-hand side is negative, we can simply do left-hand side times right hand. Does this still work? So if we have negative two plus four, is that the same as two plus negative four? So negative two plus four is two. Two plus negative four is negative two. They're not the same, right? So we can't just simply do the same thing. But negative four minus, or negative four plus two, interesting. So this is a, this is a tough one. But if the right-hand side is negative, we can simply do left-hand side minus right-hand side. And the left-hand side is not. Right? If both are negative, it's the same thing if the right-hand side is negative or not, because we can simply do negative two minus four, right? Instead of plus negative four. Let's think about this. What actually needs to happen to the mantissa? if it's negative or not. So when we add this, I think we just kind of need to do this. Left, uh, We're basically going to say set the sign bit if it's negative. But setting this sign bit, what will that actually do? Because there's no sign bit here. This is an unsigned number. So it's almost like we have to do signed, uh, signed subtraction here, which kind of sucks. Uh, so we're going to have an S32. I put an I like, uh, like a weirdo. So we have the mantissa, which is signed from an unsigned. We want to say... Uh, if the left-hand side is meant to be negative then we would like to treat the left mantissa as if it was negative. And then I think we need to do the same thing for the right mantissa. So if the mantissa of the right side is, n if we, we get it, if it's negative, we make it negative because this is an unsigned number. That should be fine. And then we add these new new things using signed integer addition. And then we 
cast that to a U32 implicitly to get the new mantissa. We treat those bits and we move on. And then how do we know if it's, if it's negative or not? If new mantissa, right? So, okay, okay. So this is gonna be temp mantissa then, and this is gonna be signed. And then we're gonna say, if temp mantissa is less than zero, I don't know if this is gonna work at all. <laughs> we're gonna go not negative. Negative equals true. Linter OS equals your OS. Is it based on the Linux kernel? No. It is a completely from scratch. I, I wrote everything from the bootloader and we have now uh, got everything for a kernel. We got user space. We got C++ runtime. We got lots of stuff going good. Major shout out to Serraid for that. Uh, Stoth Stothk85, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate it so much. I cannot believe I am over 400 at this point. Jeez. Vegans is very impressive. Reminds me of Terry Davis. I'm glad. That's an honor. Uh, Terry Davis is awesome. Seeing Temple OS truthfully made me feel like one person can do something crazy. It's not like worthless to do it. You know what I mean? So if the mantissa is negative, we want to make it not negative after recording that it is negative. That way we can convert it to a U32 and do this thing. And then we can use that flag. That's not quite right. <laughs> One dot hmm, times two to the huh. So it seems like our mantissa string is empty sometimes. So while mantissa blah. So we're going to say if mantissa do this thing. Else... Return zero. Don't even need braces. Our teeth are straight. Okay, so now we have 1.0 times 2 to the blah. Which doesn't really make sense. Also, our, our little representation down here, I think we can make better. The sum dot negative. We can say, if it's negative, do a thing, otherwise do nothing. Then don't print any space or anything like that. Does this need, yeah. So do this everywhere. And then, foo. That's a little better. So clearly we should be getting zero, but we're getting 1.0. And the reason is this leading bit is actually implicit, if you remember. So how do we actually store zero if there's a leading one that's implicit? I don't know. <laughs> we gotta check. Uh, oh, I was using this handy, handy dandy calculator earlier. It's a converter. I can link it in chat or in the anything if you need. Okay, so it looks like when everything is zero, that's just treated as zero. Is this a special value? I don't think so. There are two kinds of zero, plus zero and minus zero, naturally. 
So how would we know zero? So new exponent. So when we add two things, if we add their mantissos and we end up with zero, we don't even need to like do all this nonsense. We can just return the value that we know it's going to be zero. Oh, interesting. Because there's an offset, the exponent of zero of negative 127 is actually uh, reserved as zero, which is why we're not printing this right, because we're not detecting that special case. Because we kind of can't because we're just kind of doing it by hand. Okay, so this will be a good time to do this and just do ASCII scientific representation, right? And then out plus equals mantissa string. And we, we could probably use standard format. I mean, we can't, but I want to. <laughs> so if this is negative, we'd like to do a dash. Otherwise, we'd like to do nothing. I guess we could do kind of a little more clear. And then we can do one dot the mantissa string times two to the exponent which needs to be treated as like a number and then the whole point of this was that if not exponent turn zero times to I'd rather just return zero. I think that's fine. If not an exponent and not mantissa, no leading. Another way to do this would be, yeah, this is fine. I mean, it'd be, it'd be better if we did, if representation and not sign mask equals zero. So if everything but the sign mask is not set, then we basically want to say out plus equals zero no matter what, negative out plus equals. So we can just put this above. Oof. That was rough, all to get zero. <laughs> Fog, okay, so we're adding a negative number to a positive number, can we do the other way around, is that working? That's also working, okay, Pog. What if they're both negative? <laughs> okay. I think that's right. I think it worked, chat. I think it worked. And if they're both positive, Hey, 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 ha, ha. We're going good, chat. Rosuck says, do you write tests? 
Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I write tests. I don't know if I'm being called out <laughs> or if I'm being questioned. Uh, for example, I'm pretty sure that the, uh, the latest changes here also added a test to demonstrate this. So on the compiler, almost every feature has a test. And in this case, we added a test for, uh, like, you can't make a reference to an integer from the number 4. That doesn't really make sense because assigning to the number 4 doesn't, uh, doesn't hold up. So this is now an error, which is ensured by this test. And there's an entire tests uh, directory you can go check out for tests that I've written, mostly. <laughs> For this project, if you switch to using standard bit cast instead of reinterpret cast, you can make this entire thing const expert and use static assert to test it at compile time. Bit cast is C20, right? As far as I know. Yeah, it's C20. Oh, I should know that because it's const expert, but. It's C++ 20, which I guess is fine. So if that's fine, we could make this thing const expert. I don't really know how we would do that. Do we just make a const expert struct? That doesn't seem right. Would all of these have to be marked const expert? I can't because that's not a static. Could like here though. All the functions. You have to make every function, yeah. And the only thing that isn't const expert right now is the constructor. Hence the issue. Is that allowed? Why are you mad? Oh, because it's a string. Duh. <laughs> Yeah, the function that you string probably can't be const expert. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I I was just going through all of them. Like, why doesn't this work? Is this fine? This isn't a literal type. Okay, that kind of sucks. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So this can be const expert. This can be const expert. This can be const expert. <laughs> this can. So you're telling me if I use a bit cast to a U32 from F, is that how this works? Bitcast is not a member of standard. Oh, I don't, I'm not, uh, I didn't do the thing. I don't remember what it is. Ooh, hello? My Emacs has left me. Oh, there you are. Twenty? Sure. Still nothing. Twenty three. <laughs> I don't think I have a new enough compiler to do that. Is there an if def I can do to that?
Could I do like if def const expert? What is the what's what's an if def I could do here? Beautiful. Thank you so much. Otherwise, it'll be non const expert reinterpret cast using a pointer and an address. Good enough. Uh, and then we'd have to do like test.cpp, include all this, and then do the static stuff. First, I wanted to, now that we can add two numbers, which is pretty pog, right? Now that we can add two numbers, it would be great Yeah, it would be great if, I mean, we, we're still not handling negative infinity, positive infinity, rounding exactly. We have to set the bottommost bit to zero. And then, oh yeah, and also NAN. We have to handle not a number. Forgot about that. But uh, other than that, which are edge cases that you almost never run into. We can add two floats together, pog. Okay, and da, 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 da. I'm trying to think if I can make this part of this a member function on any of these. So this mantissa mask and exponent bit, interesting. What if I just did like a, a to address add and then implemented opera, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's try that. So we're gonna have load impl operator plus right hand side. Now it doesn't know whether to call this one or this one. But because we need to change this stuff, I really just want access to these things within here. I mean, technically I could do like add and then implement it that way. Neutrinos, edge cases you'll never run into, smiles in JavaScript. <laughs> So it says also the way you're supposed to test for that is to include version and then do if has cpp attribute cpp libcast. Okay. I don't think I've ever done that, so this will be cool. First time for everything. Has cpp attribute. You can see it? Uh, cool. Thank you so much, Sir Aid. I appreciate that. So if we implement this, I'm just trying to think about it. We kind of need to change left-hand side. So what if we just had normalize as a static? Well, it can't be static, really. Hmm. So I'm trying to think about this, that maybe if we're able to template, templatize, make a template out of this sign mask and mask stuff. But that means that it wouldn't be able to be used here. Unless we did a template specification. So let's do like a to address add. but this is going to add like into what we have, right? Sure.
And it's going to basically be this same thing, except, I know, copy and paste. Except a few things are going to be different. There's not any left-hand side prefix, because these are all member functions of what we are currently using. We can name this right-hand side just to make things easy on ourselves. And then I can also do... Okay, perfect. And then as far as... Why are you mad? Called object type bool is not a... Oh, interesting. Okay. So is negative. And then we don't actually need to return anything. We just need to call set or whatever it is. I cannot type. Uh, false zero zero. Yeah. And the reason for this is hopefully now I can just do float. I can basically do, yeah. This. Oh, 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 oh that's what I, okay. Jesus, I'm jumping all over the place. But I can move those back into here and then not use them here anymore because I can now left hand side to add right hand side return left hand side. And technically I could have this return like a float impl reference and then return this, but I don't think that's really necessary. Unless you guys think it is, but I don't think it is. And the reason this is advantageous is we can now maybe start to templatize this stuff, which is going to look ugly. I think I'm going to do it like this. And first of all, we're going to have a type name representation. And that's going to be U32. And then we're going to have some representations, which is sign mask. The three masks, right? Exponent. Mantissa. The three bits. Which technically, Mantissa bit is always assumed to be zero. So we can actually have this be a static const expert repper mantis fit equals zero. It doesn't need to be passed. And then the exponent bias moon pie dumplings says one word first time chat Linux. <laughs> Windows. We're communicating. Uh, and now, the real idea would be to say, yeah, this isn't going to work the same way anymore. I know. Something like this. So this is U32. Uh -huh. the exponent mask, the mantissa mask. Sign bit, exponent bit, exponent bias. And then can we really not do this? 
That's unfortunate. So I'm surprised we can't do this, honestly. So how do we get this type of thing? So it says, can't do what? Moon Pie Dumpling says no. <laughs> uh, not easily, Kuomar. So it can't do what? We can't do, basically, now that this is templatized, it would be great if we could, like, define this for every template. You know what I mean? Like for all the template instantiations, because it's going to be the same. There's nothing like per template that we're using here. So do I have to like literally just define one of these operators for each of the binary 32, like for each using that we do? Or am I able to like implement this type of add some other way? Uh, Kumar, to expand upon your question, maybe one could use less template of arguments and derive the masks instead. We could, but, I mean, there's no reason to. So it says just make it a member function. Can I, I mean, can I literally just do that? That or a function template. I don't know how function template would work. So now we're going to have to get rid of one, right? And then we're going to have to add to the right-hand side. Luckily, it's commutative. So we can do this. This is going to be trickier for, like, subtraction. This seems messy, you know what I mean? Because I just want to get a three address add where left plus right equals a third thing and you don't screw with your operands. You're just going to have to make a copy of pointer this. Yeah, so it's the same every time. It's just a little funky. It's fine. But that's basically a no-op, so that doesn't matter. I see. Yeah, it's, it's literally just moving one register. So something like that for operator minus. And then obviously we need sub. Sub is going to be very similar because all we kind of need to do is subtract here. Which makes me think we could do that with a template. But that seems like maybe a little overkill. <laughs> right? We could also do it with like a bool pass to it. So subtracting is just adding with flipped sign, right? Yep. I mean, depends on what you're doing. What we're doing here, it's a slightly more complicated because we're subtracting and adding floating points, but yeah. So it says, sure, you can make it a template. You can add a bool template parameter. I almost typed serrated. <laughs> uh, is subtraction. Which equals false. This is going to be add sub. And then we're going to say if... Do I do if is subtraction... Trying to think how to do this. Do I... Camel case, F, skull, true anguish, etc. <laughs> it's a template, man. I guess it doesn't have to be. It's sub. Why not? 
if const expert. That's what I was, okay, that's what we need. Uh, if const expert is sub do subtraction else I forgot that part else do addition Const expert is a C17 extension. Aren't we using 20? <laughs> oh god. So now. I guess this could be an enum as well. Well, it compiles. Some F diff just another little test. See what happens. <laughs> Negative five point nine. We have two point one. Right? Bar should still be, yeah, 2.1. Sum is 4.2, so 4.2 minus 2.1 should get us 2.1. <laughs> it's not quite, uh, quite working there. So I wonder if we try the other way which would be affecting the sign bits. So if we left this as is, but then if we're subtracting, we basically flip negativity of the right-hand side as far as I know. So then we say, if we're subtracting right mantis uh, times equals negative one. Still not going great, okay. That's an interesting one. Add sub true is sub, if const express sub right mantis times equal negative one. Wizard A's one says, hello, how's it going, Wizard A's? Thank you so much for the follow, along with vegan, 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 vegan. <laughs> well, subtraction isn't as easy as I planned. I'm just going to get rid of the uh, this then, because it's it's not, not quite working. And we're going to call it add. And we're going to separate out sub. Wizard A's says, all good, man. What about you? I'm doing okay. I'm just working on this silly little thing for part, no particular reason even. We can probably extract that out as well. Let's try that first before we copy this. So we're gonna do void normalize with match exponents to the of both 
given floats to the largest of either one given. Hopefully that makes sense. And we're basically going to take this. Okay. And maybe we'll just slap that with exponent. Well, it, it also has to deal with the mantissa. Wizard Days says, I'm about to start learning C++ for some reasons. What's your advice for me? Uh, get, <laughs> get better advice. Uh, no, I don't know. I would say just do it. Make write code. Don't get caught up in like too much. Just start writing code. Ozirik says, hello, how is that OS development going? Really good. If uh, if you want, we can take a, take a moment to check it out. Let's check out the OS development. As you can see, it's building. And uh, it's generating the booth media now. And I believe it will work, as far as I know. Cool. Well, it still works. Here it is. Wow. Hello there. How about that? As you can see, we are now actually transmitting packets through the network, and we are even receiving a packet back, which is an ARP reply to us, which is this is the virtual MAC address that QEMU is given. It's not mine. And this is the ARP ether type. So we're getting an ARP packet uh, reply after we send out an ARP request to get the uh, MAC address of the local router, which I didn't want to show. But yeah, and as you can see, that's all happening during multiprocessing while we have, we can run Blaze it in the shell and process working directory and echo and stuff like that. It's all working really good, I'd say. It's going great, to answer your question. Okay. Sub. So, according to this we can add or subtract in the same way once we have them here, which is just this. And then we make it positive and we don't worry about it. Hmm. Uh, Ozirik says write code and don't abandon on the first difficulty. C++ is notoriously difficult, so it's normal to fail and find it hard at first. That's a good, that's a great point. I was very angry. Doodlebug Dev says, so C Sharp or C++? Both. If you're interested in more than one language, learn more than one language. There's no limit. It's not like I only know one. C-sharp for games. <sighs> uh. The government is not going to get me if I learn more languages? Kappa. Lamau pick. <laughs> uh. Ozirik says, if you begin with a low-level language, the next languages to learn will be easier. 
Well, maybe. Wizard A says, ha 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 ha. I mean, learn starting with brain fuck is quite low level, but it doesn't help you. Game dev is the easiest type of, of development. <laughs> Modern game dev. I mean, I'd agree. Even in universities, they start with teaching like the basics of C, like for loops and while loops and variables and assigning things and functions and control flow. And then from there, you start to learn like pointers and references in C++. And if you start to like go that route, I'd agree it gets easier and easier as you move on to higher level languages like Python, because though Python is just a wrapper around C, whether or not they like it. Unreal is definitely not ideal for programming 2D card games. I know that now. 2D games in general. It's, I mean, it's not, a, you can use it, but it's overall a 3D engine. The 2D is kind of hacky because you still have shaders and, or you have to use a, a flat shade. It's just, it's, it's a mess. What are we doing? We're trying to subtract. And when we subtract two numbers, we should be able to just do something like this. So, for example, 7 times 10 to the 5, this is tiny. 7 times 10 to the 5 minus 5.2 times 10 to the 4. 5.2 times 10 to the 4, you have to move over. I guess they moved this one over times 10 to the 4, so they made this one smaller. That's fine. Then they subtract them. And then they normalize it. That should be exactly what we're doing. It's just not working too great. So subtracting a number a negative number is the same as adding yeah it really seems like we should be able to do this it's just not working properly for some reason what is going wrong Also, how do you execute code when everyone is connected? Yeah, good luck. Wizard Days says, did you learn coding from college or just yourself? Just myself. I didn't even uh, graduate high school. Bozirik says, yeah, for 2D Unity or Godot are better suited. I'd say Godot is better suited in general for 2D. Unity even is rough. He's talking about multiplayer, as far as I know. If it's a card game, generally you want more than one person in a card game. And it, attempting multiplayer game dev is not simple. So we're just getting the holy, holy wrong number. Can we figure out what our actual diff is in this way? So don't I have this in like ASCII representation? This will be much better to read. <laughs> Hmm. 
Oof. That didn't seem to work. It nearly did. It seems like this part's working fine. I don't, I'm not sure why it's negative, but, uh, the exponent is wrong. Interesting. Another thing that I, I didn't go through and change yet is that everywhere it says U32, it should say representation. Except for there. Perfect. So I'm not sure why is this why is this not working? Why are we not printing the number properly? We should be able to cast it to like a U32 and it fixes that. Am I crazy? I want to print this as a number. So if I'm trying to print it, I'm trying to add it to the string as a number, I should just be able to do something like that, like adding in max t, but that's not working. Serrate, am I going crazy? You're still using S32. Oh, I am. I'm trying to think, if you do like signed unsigned int. I don't think that's valid. We're just going to do this. It's not it's not best the best. Standard make signed repper. Ooh, I didn't know that was a thing. Can I do that in the template? It's probably not a thing. Can I do that like here? Fancy. Very fancy. I'm just going to do this. We did S8. Now it's 32. That's worrying. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> Still works. Uh, okay, now we got to figure out why this doesn't work. 
not this, this, why does exponent not be handled correct? I just want to print a signed number into this string. How do I do this? <laughs> How do I append a signed number to a string? I really don't know. It's standard two string. Oh my god. Okay, pog. <laughs> We're back. We're back in business, baby. Why how does this diff make any sense? Cuz this number minus this number should be 0. So something crazy is happening. See, this is what happens when you don't use lib format. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Oh, lib format. Even just standard format would make this doable because all of this would become this. It would literally be one huh, times two to the huh. That is it. That is it. <laughs> It'd be return <laughs> with a few arguments, right? With like negative dash. It'd be so easy <laughs> with a standard format. Sraid says, you can say I'm somewhat familiar with networking. <laughs> yeah, you should check out the uh, the uh, most recent video on the YouTube. Just went up a few days ago, yesterday, I don't know. It might be interesting. Also, Hugh Davenport, Hacky Hacks, Doodle Bug Dev. Thank you so much for the follows. I appreciate it so much. Welcome to this exclusive community. It's so hard to get into. You clicked a button. <laughs> no, but I do appreciate you so much. And I hope you'll stick around for next time. Be sure to check out the YouTube and links down below. And also the Discord links because we, we love having new people in the Discord. And there are announcements every time I go live. Ooh, new people like Umos. But there are announcements every time I go live, so feel free to uh, ask to join the notice group and you'll be pinged every time I go live. Whoa. Anyways, that's that. Uh, so we now have things being printed out properly. So we now have to think about what's happening here. So I think what's happening with subtract is we have to do an unsigned subtraction. <laughs> so like negative one, so let's just do two minus one, right? That's going to effectively be two times 10 to the zero minus one times 10 to the zero. And that's going to be equal to 1 times 10 to the 0. Now if we have 2 times 10 to the 0 minus negative 1, right? Minus negative 1 times 10 to the 0. That's going to equal... 2 minus negative 1. Well, that should actually be 3, so we need, yeah. Three times 10 to the 0. So we do need signed uh, subtraction here. Because 2 minus negative 1 needs to mean needs to be an addition. That results in 3. So this mantissa I'm kind of curious as to what it actually is. So let's just think about a subtraction. Negative so like 
two dot four times ten to the zero, one times ten to the zero. Draconia asks, writing a custom language. Well, I am, but not right now. I'm working on quite a few things. I'm working on a custom language called Intercept. That's available on the GitHub. Right now, I'm working on implementing IEEE 754 floating point numbers, which is really just scientific notation in binary. Just for funsies, really. But if this grows into something that's actually usable, then it means that I could use this implementation of floats. I could write a C API and call it from intercept my language. And then we could have floats that are interoperable with C because we can get the C style floats to and from them. But yeah, so this may possibly end up being used in intercept with a C API, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's mainly just for funsies. Uh, left-hand side equals this, sub right-hand side, return left-hand side. Hmm. So it says the only problem would be the calling conventions because floats are passed in XMM registers. I mean, it should be fine. That would be the minimal, that would be the only register allocation we actually need to do, so. It, it would be doable. You're right that we would have to handle that case. It's not going to be as simple as, oh, just call it. But, uh, yeah. So if negative, make it negative. If negative, make it negative. So we're doing... So we're ending up with a negative mantissa, which doesn't really make sense. Because, so we're subtracting 2.1, and we're subtracting it from sum, which is about 4.2. So we should get back to 2.1. Where'd I go? How'd I lose it? Where am I? Oh god. Okay. So this mantissa is actually negative, which means this will trigger, right? So if this is negative, that means that the right mantis was bigger. So it's almost like what we have to do, <laughs> this would be cursed. I don't know, I'm just trying to think about this, uh, think through this. Let's look at someone else's. That way I, I don't get stuff wrong. Why? Okay. Uh, 
the power must be the same in both terms in order to add or subtract. Once the power matches, just add or subtract. So it should only end up negative if it is negative. So why are we having it end up negative when it shouldn't be? So what if I don't do those? I think it's going to be the same because they're not negative. So those aren't happening anyway. That's true. So interesting. So I think we're actually going to have to change it so that the left mantissa is always bigger than the right one. <laughs> Mr. Mugame, I hate OOP, bro. I've been searching for some code in the Java AWT source, and I'm going to fucking die. This is fucking inheritance hell. How many levels is this? <laughs> Java moment. <laughs> okay. Move decimal point to the right. So we actually have something to subtract. Is that true? Interesting. So when this is negative, the answer still may be positive. So thinking about it, because this is just the difference in the mantissa, not the actual value, which is going to be one dot blah, 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 something. Because we should have one dot oh blah 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 and one dot oh blah 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 to the two. So then in getting it to the same value, right? What do we actually do? So when we subtract, we need to get them to the same value, right? So we're going to do acting to performing the minus blip something like that Oop, forgot a new line Yeah, it's a little messy because I forgot the new one. <laughs> so it's performing, as you can see, 2 to the 2 times 2 to the 1. And then we can say normalized. So after they've been normalized, you can see that they're both 2 to the 2. But this one is now 1.524999. Interesting. I wonder if the normalized code is wrong. What is this equal to? 6.1. I don't know where 6.1 comes from. <laughs> so the normalized code is almost definitely wrong, right? Yeah. Near definitely. Because technically, this should be equal to whatever it was before. Ah, oh, and I'm starting to get the issue now. Ah. 
I am starting to get the issue. So the problem, mainly, is that I believe we're running out of bits. Because I believe the Mantissa being only 30, uh, yeah, 30, 23 bits is having a problem. Which IDE are you coding on? This is called Emacs. It is from the 1980s, and I recommend it. So while our exponent is greater is less than the other exponent, then plus plus our exponent. And this isn't really an IDE, it's more of an, uh, an OS. <laughs> GNU Emacs, like that. Our mantissa to the right equals one. Equal right hand side exponent and then we're going to have right hand side mantissa equal the right hand side mantissa I think that's correct, yeah. So I could even call this the same left right type of thing. I guess we could still use those for being signed versus not signed. Sure. Okay. And then... <laughs> I may have I may have done that too quickly. That may have worked anyway. I don't know if I've changed anything. Well, the difference is different, so I have changed something. And I think that would be the problem, at least one of them. The right-hand side exponent Technically, we don't really need the exponent here, but it's it's still fine. And technically, we don't need a new one here, but it's fine. Just to be clear, 4.2 minus 2.1 should be 2.1. <laughs> but it's not quite working out. Normalized. Now not normalized because they're not updated.
So we'll do right hand side dot set exponent right hand side exponent. I update the right hand side. Update the left hand side. Interesting, this is the same. It's confusing how we get 52499, like a way larger fraction. Maybe I'm freaking out for no reason. It seems like we're subtracting 0 0.1 but adding 2. Is that possible? Adding 2. Where would we actually be adding? Two. So, because so this would add two, would it not? Do we actually need to do the opposite here and make the exponent smaller? So if there's a something left over, that should be our result. But if the result is too big, we can't store it. So to store it in the mantissa, we have to shift it to the right one and add to our exponent. What should the answer be? It should be this thing. No, this thing. Which means that technically all we have to do is subtract one from the exponent and the rest should stay the same. Which doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll wait on subtraction, huh? <laughs> it's not going well. And just like that, it works. And then I think also another thing that would be smart to do is make a float constructor. which just returns the bit cast if we can. How do I do this properly? I think this is how it works. And otherwise, we're going to treat it as a float pointer and dereference it, which is representation. Is that allowed? That's not allowed. Expectify, expected unqualified ID before blip token. How do I define this type of constructor or whatever this is meant to be? Because as far as I know, that's like the you can do the same thing with a bool. To create it, right? Is that allowed? It's not allowed. So how do I do that? Uh, it's like a conversion constructor. Converting constructor. User defined conversion operator. Yes, that. This thing. Operator. Ah. 
There we go. That's better. And now we should just be able to do this. And it should quote unquote just work. What do you mean no member ASCII scientific? It's right here. Oh, I didn't uh, fix the broken one. Might might change some things. Hey, Pog champ. So let's do. I'm assuming this will be broken. Yeah. <laughs> close though my favorite is that it literally adds the uh, exponent <laughs> uh. thank you sir Ray. that helped a lot that makes this much cleaner and not not so messy Okay, so the normalize width is totally broken. So we're not gonna have that be a, a function just because it's broken. We're just gonna get this working first. Right? Now let's think about what the actual issue is. We need to increase our exponent until we reach the other's exponent. So to increase our exponent, we have to divide our mantissa by the base that it's in, which is 2. Dividing by 2 is the same as bit shifting to the right, so we just need to bit shift to the right once to divide by 2. First time chat from Danny Undos. Hi, everyone. What's up, Danny? And then we say while right hand side exponent is less than exponent. But they should be equal, so this should never happen. If this happened, but if this didn't happen, then this will now happen. And the right hand side its exponent will be increased and each time until we end up with a number at the end, which is totally wrong, four. Because we should have three. Well, I guess let's check out the sum is 22.2, which is kind of crazy. Call me Endos. You got it. Nuke Zone says, hey, how's it going? What's up, Nuke Zone? It is a pleasure to have you. Endos says, I'm a South Korean. Nice. That makes sense why I mispronounced the name. I just saw Danny and assumed. <laughs> I was like, I've seen Danny before. I'm going, I'm going for it. Uh... So when we set exponent to exponent plus one, then we go here, exponent should be the new exponent. So let's do like, exponent difference, right? Which is going to be exponent minus right-hand side dot exponent. And then we're going to say if exponent difference is greater than zero, set our exponent to exponent 
plus exponent difference. Set the mantissa. The mantissa bit shifted to the right. Bit shifted to the right. Exponent difference. Endos, uh, CM Rant says, what you building? And Endos says, why homemade floats, if I may ask? Homemade floats, because why not? <laughs> I don't know. I, when I was sick, I kind of got, uh, like a week ago, I was laying in bed a long time, and I just, I figured out that floats to me were like black magic, and I had no idea how they worked. And that kind of bothered me. So I learned all about how floats worked and I am able to do them by hand now and like convert between the bases and stuff. And uh, I just thought it'd be fun to actually write some code to go along with that knowledge. So if it's greater than zero, else if it's less than zero, then we need to set the other exponent to the other exponent that we need to make it positive. Make difference positive, and then we can set the differences. Like so. Sure. Endos says, comparable to me implementing arbitrary precision floats, I guess. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's just for funsies. And if they're equal, we don't have to do anything. So that should kind of simplify this a little bit. And we can also do the print out the exponent difference way easier. Simran says, "So, what are you building? <laughs> Homemade floats. Uh, basically, the C language." has a float data type implemented using this standard, right, the IEE 754. And with this standard, the single precision floating point format is the one that C uses for float. So I'm just implementing this and uh, interopping with C floats. Eventually, this might end up being used in my programming language as the implementations for uh, the floats in the language so that we don't have to do XMM register allocation for like, or live ranges with different register classes. We can just do like, uh, you know, software implementations of the same thing and function calls, which is much easier. And then I also thought about using it in the OS to in the kernel so that we don't worry have to worry about like stomping on user space XMM floating point registers. We can just use a software float in the kernel and not worry about that stuff. Simrits, GG's, I thought you were making like some interpreter or compiler. Oh fuck, well, I was kind of right. <laughs> yep. Molly the man says, what do you think about Zig? I haven't used it enough. I don't know. It looks really cool. Jeff Irwin says negative zero for the win. <laughs> yes. Ugh. So we're doing things horribly wrong. Exponent difference is two. But then we end up with a crazy 
it's like we're multiplying somehow. So the left hand side should get bigger twice, right? So if exponent difference is greater than zero, this should happen. We set the exponent to exponent plus exponent difference. So just, just checking. Setting exponent to blah. Set exponent to blah. Mr. Mokume says, return of Zigman. Ah! Set exponent to 5. Now that doesn't make sense. See, that doesn't make sense at all. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Am I crazy? Is that... Uh, I feel like I'm missing something. But did I just get lucky? I shouldn't need to do two string if I'm using the O stream. Set exponent to three, set exponent to five. How is exponent 3 and this is 2? What? <laughs> I've got to be insane. I've got to be insane. Am I, do I have to do this? That would be like ridiculous, but let's see. Am I just... Is it happenstance? No. <laughs> no. Exponent is three. Did I just get this backwards? So if it's less than zero, I make it positive. That's at least a closer answer. Ah, <sighs> da 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 da. So the left hand side is some large number, which I didn't expect. Like, how are these backwards? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, because we're calling right hand side dot add this. Okay. So it's, it's backwards. That's fine. Good to know. So because it's backwards, why do, why does this matter? That means afterwards the right hand side should end up with a larger exponent, but that's not happening. Yeah, it means what we had going before was was the way to do it. Just checking things. See, and now we're adding to the wrong one. See, this... <laughs> this is why I don't do things. 
Okay, we're at least closer. We're at least closer. Jeff Irwin, you were right. I was flapping things around and they ended up the same. We're at least closer because the left-hand side and right-hand side now have the same, actually have the same power. So we can add or subtract them supposedly now. Does that make any sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So I wonder if this needs the leading bit removed. I am curious if that matters. Well, it does seem to change the result, right? It definitely changes the result by two, so that we'll keep that in mind. Uh, da -da -da -da. Is that PowerShell prompt? No, it is not. This is the new shell prompt. New shell. Oh God, what have I done? I think I opened up new shell within new shell. Oh god. <laughs> That's better. It's new shell. Okay, so our normalized code is just not correct. Well, it, it should be now. So why is our answer completely wrong? <laughs> uh, hmm. Oh, okay. So this may seem obvious. So we should just be able to make the number smaller. Make the number smaller. Okay, so maybe this really is a big deal that we don't have a leading bit here. Because if we have a leading bit, that means that the, the number we're shifting in is a one. And if we're shifting in a one, then we're not gonna be making 0.34 from 3.4. Am I right? I guess the three does stay there. So maybe this, this is incorrect. But then my question is, I guess, either way, is that if we're doing this, however many times we do this, don't we kind of also need to undo that to the answer? Or am I insane in thinking that? So if we do like 3.4 times 10 to the 5 times 9 times 10, times 10 to the 6, then we get 0 0.34, 10 to the 6, 9.7, 10 to the 6. We add them, but adding them, yeah, gets us in 10 to the 6, and then we can move it over and get 10 to the 7. So we never have to like undo this shifting that we did to 0.34. And that 10 to the 10 6 should be this thing. Hmm. So it says control D should quit out of the shell. That's, I was trying control C, so it's probably that. Jeff Irwin says it was embarrassingly slow to implement double precision floating point arithmetic at the <laughs> yeah yeah our goal isn't to be fast or efficient it's just like to make it work in this one case 
so I'm kind of curious how we're getting four here. That means we're adding to this exponent and shifting the mantissa down. But we would only need to do that if we actually exceed one in this case. So I wonder if we need no, I'm just gonna see what happens here. Well, we didn't add two, but we're nearer. <laughs> Just curious. So 8.1 plus 2.1 10 is 10.2. Okay, so we just did it. Pog. Poggers. Okay. Is it still working in general? No. <laughs> hmm. So it works in some cases, but not others now. Whereas if I use the leading everywhere, that's definitely broken. But that works. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, didn't mean to open Steam. <laughs> Got some more work done on my indexer GUI, Pog. I'll have to check that out later. Oh. I'm pretty sure that's 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 there. Mr. Mukume says some is good enough for me. <laughs> right? We don't need anything more. It's fine. <laughs> we can't even sum every two numbers though. If we have to shift their power. Somehow we're doing it wrong. And we're getting 18.2. So if we don't use the leading bit here, then we get the proper answer, 10.2. That's the actual proper answer. But that means that then the sum of the others <laughs> don't work. Ugh. Oops. Mr. Mugume says, I remember implementing division on my 8-bit PC with no bit shifting. Oh god. <laughs> Why would you do such a thing to yourself? Uh, no, that does sound pretty awesome. Your 8-bit PC. Doing stuff in hardware is always just so cool. Isn't this exponent just one off? Well, nearly, that'd be 4.4. So the exponent is one off and the mantissa is double. Suspicion. <laughs> the exponent is one off. And the mantissa is double. 
So we're not doing one of these when we should be. So what if I just say, if it's set, do a thing. Okay, it's still incorrect. Which is interesting. So while the new mantissa and not mask, put it to the right one. <laughs> Sarade says, I got up early today, so I think I'm going to call it a day now. So we're laters. Bye, Sarade. Everyone say bye to Sarade. We love Sarade. Good night, Sarade. Get some good sleep. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm excited for some more networking with you soon. Well, that didn't seem to be working. But yeah, so it seems like we actually need this to be over to... And this thing is what we actually need to... Yeah. So we are just so close. So if we shift a one in, Molly the man says, good night, smart friend. That's right. That's right. Uh, okay. So for this new mantissa, why are, why are we not doing it? Right, so our sum is meant to be half of this and double this. Why is that not happening? So we add them together. We're adding them together without the leading bits. So we need these leading bits included in the calculation. That screws this one up. <laughs> How come? How come? So then this new mantissa if it's above the value then we do one of these things So what is this actual number? 18.2, right? So can I take this number like I did here? Divided by two. And less here. Yeah, that's still not correct. So it, it's uh, we're getting something really wrong here. Most likely due to this little case. So to make one point one hundred and nine. This is two point one, right? This crazy number here. And two point one. What I'm interested in is how would we implement this as two to the three? We'd have to divide this by two once and then twice. And when we divide it by two, we, we just want to make it smaller. We don't really want to do anything other than divide it by two. But I don't know if this is going to help either because that broke our other one. 
Well, that's closer. We still have 4.2, so that's a good sign. But we now have 16.2 instead of 18.2. We need 10.2, so this is closer. This is good. This is good. <laughs> uh, so when we divided by 2, divided by 2, we should get this number to the third, which is also, should be, see that's not the same number, that's 8.1. Is this 8.1? See this shouldn't be 8.1. That's this number. So am I doing this the wrong way? Am I going crazy here? Do I need to multiply by two? <laughs> right? So what if I tried to make the bigger one smaller instead of the way I'm doing it now? So to do that, make the larger one smaller. So if exponent difference is greater, that means that left-hand side is greater than right-hand side, which means that we would change left-hand side to be left-hand side minus the difference multiplied by 2 that many times. Otherwise, we'd be dealing with the right-hand side difference. Did I get it backwards? Well, not quite, but that is... <laughs> Closer. 4.2 again! Woo! <laughs> what am I doing wrong here? I'm not, I'm not quite certain what I'm getting wrong. I know I'm getting something wrong, but I'm not quite certain what. How are we getting 16 here? Because it's 2 to the 4. 1 times 2 to the 4 is 16, right? 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2, 16. So if there's 2 to the 4 here, it's too high. So can we actually go look at that little conversion calculator and see what we would actually need? 10.2. 10.2, we should end up with an exponent of 3 and a mantissa of that. 0.2749 blah blah. So, one point two seven four nine times two to the three. Why are we getting two to the four then? So, is this? Just checking. Okay, that, that just makes the wrong answer for all of them. Good to know. We've already cleared the sign bit, I would hope. It's zero according to this thing. Are you discarding the leading one? We are here, but not down here. Do we need to discard the leading one? I don't think so. Because there's always a leading one. You don't need to store it. I think we definitely need it in here. So then... 
see, the confusing thing So let's just print out normalized left hand side followed by the right hand side. So this is going to be ASCII scientific. But the way they're getting summed looks like it was. I see. See, it doesn't make sense that these are basically equal because we're just adding 8.1 plus 8.1 right now. <laughs> it's like the mantissa isn't being updated properly. Does set mantissa actually work? It definitely should work. Sign mask, exponent mask, mantis a mask, sign bit, exponent bit, exponent bias. Okay. That, the mask looks fine. It looks like we're setting it properly. So if I don't discard the leading bit here, we get the wrong answer. We don't get the wrong answer, but we get the wrong answer here still. But is this correct? I think this might be correct now. I just might be doing something else wrong. That's not what I want to do. Hey, that's now 10.1. 10.1. It's supposed to be 8.1 and it's 10.1. How have we done such things? What? Are you implementing floats to practice or because you like floats? <laughs> uh, let's go for practice. So right hand side being equal to 10.2 is quite confusing. Can you show me how we got there? <laughs> so we never see a negative exponent difference, okay. Okay, so we have a positive exponent difference of 2, which means that we're going to alter the right-hand side by increasing its exponent by 2. So it changes from this. Is that true? No. What have I done? I don't think I'm actually printing it out. Because we have 2.1 and we have 8.1. There it is. Okay. Maybe I'm crazy. I thought, I feel like I did that and I got a different answer. Anyways, these then get flipped. So the left-hand side 
stays as 8.1, fantastic. But the right-hand side, which was actually the 2.1 that we had before, right? There's too many of these. That is now 10.2 somehow. So this isn't keeping things equal, even though it technically should, I feel like. Because 2.1 times 10 to the, let's say, 0, we can have it be 0 0.21 times 10 to the 0 times 10 to the 1, because the exponent goes up the same amount that the, that the decimal gets shifted. Red candy eater, have you drank dark chocolate milk? What? <laughs> Uh, no. Not recently? Not ever, probably? It tastes amazing. I can imagine it sounds good. Um... Well, the good news is that when you take 10.1 and 8.1 and add them, you do get 18.2. <laughs> so we are adding these properly. It's just that we're not calculating these properly. Somehow. Doesn't that make it milk chocolate? Lamau. It makes it heaven juice. <laughs> not sure how much I like that. Yeah, it doesn't work at all. Just checking. So the right-hand side mantissa will only ever get smaller. Oh, interesting. So I wonder if we have to do it through the while in order to keep getting the leading bit. Let's try it. How did I have this before? Uh, well, exponent is less than right-hand side exponent. This one. While x right-hand side is smaller than the current exponent, make the right-hand side exponent larger by one. So maybe this is where the leading bit was being lost. Shiloh says, hey, what's up, Shiloh? First time chat, how's it going? Red Candy Eater says, I barely ate last week from working too much, so I bought a lot of food. Nice. I do that sometimes too, or I forget to eat. So I'm just doing stuff. <laughs> and then it's and then it's later, and then it's a two days later, and you're like, I had a granola bar, and that's it. <laughs> Oops. Red candy eater, lol. But yeah. But yeah. But yeah, I know how that goes. <laughs> you basically, you or you work a lot and you're like, well, I bought my regular groceries, but now they kind of all piled up and I have eight pounds of food to eat by, th by Tuesday.
something like this. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Ha ha ha. Red Candy Eater says, I had a lot of pain doing number two. More calories means I can work out more anyway. <laughs> I see. That's good. That's good. Smaller than left hand side. Okay. What has happened? There are new lines. After. <laughs> Might be <laughs> causing some problems. Okay. So we have right hand side exponent is smaller than left hand side. So I want to know what this number is. And I want to know what this number is. All right, we're going to have two open. So right hand side, two, one, right? Or just, here, just, just, just get one working first. So we have 2.1 as our right-hand side. Then as our right-hand side, from 2.1, it's it becomes 6.1 somehow. I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> So, if we do no leading, it won't matter because that's not where we are. If we do no leading. Now what happens? So we end up again with 2.1, but after that, it's 4.1. <laughs> How do we keep adding 2? <laughs> <laughs> How do we keep adding two? So, because we have two to the four. So times two to the two means we're going to end up with four. So it would that, so we're dealing with subnormals because the leading one okay hold on I think we're, we're dealing with subnormals Perfect The sign is simple the exponent yes it's biased the leading bit convention okay it's not based on any historical research. Beautiful. Love it. If the exponent is zero and the fraction is zero, then the number represents plus or minus zero. So the byte zero also represents zero, which look good. Beautiful. If we only consider these rules, the smallest non-zero number that can be represented would be zero one. Where blah, blah, blah. This is where subnormals come in. Jeff Irwin says, I love seeing people doing low-level stuff like this here. Awesome, I'm glad. We like low-level stuff around here. Subnormal numbers. The engineers, blah, blah, blah. If the exponent is zero, then the leading bit becomes zero. The exponent is fixed to negative 126. Well, that's annoying. This rule immediately implies that the number such that 0, 0 is still 0. So 0, 0 is actually a subnormal number according to our definition. With this new rule, then the smallest non-subnormal number is 1, 0, which represents 1.0 times 2 to the negative 
126, which equals F F F F F F F F F F F F Okay, and the smallest non-zero subnormal number is exponent of zero with fraction one. Unable to find... Beautiful. Right, so for each exponent, you can represent different ranges of numbers. Sure. From that, we can see that for each exponent, there is no overlap between the represented numbers. For each exponent, we have the same number of floating point numbers, of whole numbers, sure, yeah. Oh, of floating point numbers, so like the possible values in each spot, yes. I really like this explanation. Now let's bring that down all the way to exponent zero. Without subnormals, it would hypothetically look like this. Zero, one, two, three, floats, blah, 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 blah. With subnormals, it looks like this. So you can see that zero now has it much uh, more evenly spaced out and everything. And we can actually represent this smaller number and such. Very cool. Subnormals double the length of range of exponent from 2 to the negative 127, 2 to the 126, to 0 to 2 to the 126, negative 126, sure. Oh lord. Okay, yes. Well, that's a subnormal. I don't know if that's helping us. So what we're realizing is that this number can't have a leading one because we're moving it. Right? Because if we actually... It's like we need to represent 2.1, but with the with a different exponent, which means that the mantissa has to sort of shift over, but not exactly shift over, right? So adding 1 to the exponent... allows the decimal point to move left or right? Let's think about this. 2.0 times 10 to the 1, why not? Can become 0 0.20, so the decimal point moves left. And because it's smaller, we need a bigger exponent. And the decimal point moving left, in this case, the mantissa always contains that. The xxxxx blah 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 is the mantissa bits or the mantissa numbers. Right? So one dot that's the mantissa here. So to actually move this to the right one, including that one, would mean that we move the decimal to the left. which is good because we increased the exponent. But then there can't be a leading one here anymore. Right hand side leading equals false, right? So I guess by default, there's gonna be a leading one unless there's not. Like if one of these happens, then we have to say left-hand side leading equals false. This might just be wrong, by the way. Oh, there's long thing to read. What do I got? What were, were you smoking? What? <laughs> he 
you, what are you guys on? I don't even know what you guys are talking about. Maybe maybe I missed something. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you on about? The cake is a lie. Okay. <laughs> At least I get that. Uh I'm going to say this else. This may just be completely wrong. <laughs> Fair warning. I'm making it up at this point. I mean, I think it's right, but it's it is confusing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jeff Irwin says, I'm just high on life. <laughs> this is a mess. So... I think we need to do the same thing here. Which kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, get right, Mantissa. Right, return. This will be beautiful. <laughs> Else return Mantissa. No leading. <laughs> How beautiful is that, hmm? And then we can say, get left mantissa. This may be the worst code in the world. <laughs> right? Ugh. Oh, oh, chat, that was it. Pog champ. Can I get a pog champ in chat, guys? <laughs> Jeff Irwin, I just ate 300 grams of raspberries and drank one liter of milk. <laughs> That's so alpha, Chad. Oh, Jeff Irwin with the, with the pog. It works. We got 10.2, boys. I think we're properly adding the numbers now with subnormal numbers. And the fact that once we do this, it becomes subnormal is kind of confusing. There's probably a much better way to do this. I mean, this isn't bad overall. I'm not going to worry about it. Can C++ inline Lambda calls? Or calls, like, inline Lambda bodies? That'd be great.
Jeff Irwin, now it's time for fuzz testing. Ah, yes. Honestly, it wouldn't be that hard, I don't think, to write a little test runner. Should we do it? Should we write a little test runner? Why not? Let's do it. Right? I have time. It shouldn't take that long, so who cares? Let's do it. You know what the hardest part is going to be? Actually, I'm just going to see if I can steal this. <laughs> the idea is... What do, where do I need to get this from? Oh, I don't even need to steal this because of how C-Test works. Pog. Yeah, it's the, the hardest part we don't have to do. Uh, Pog. Kumar says, where are the subnormals? Only case is unbiased exponent zero, which represents zero, or subnormals, in which case the implied mantis MS bit is missing. Exactly, Kumar. It's the second case that you uh, stated the latter case. So the implied mantissa bit is missing, which is what we're keeping track of with this left-hand side leading and right-hand side leading boolean. So by default, the leading bit is included, but we don't include the leading bit once the number becomes subnormal after we've shifted it and altered the exponent, which means that it's technically a 0.xxxx number where xxxx is the mantissa, right? In, which makes it subnormal, as far as I know. I may be using the wrong terminology, but I'm fairly certain that that's a, what uh, subnormal, one of the things that subnormal refers to is that this leading one is not a leading one anymore. It's a zero. But it may not exactly be subnormal. You are correct. I don't know that that's 100% the right term. All I'm saying is that the leading bit, we need to handle the case where the leading bit is no longer implicitly one because we've changed things. Like the exponent. Test runner. Um, we can basically just assert argc equals, what do we think we, how do we want to run this? It's going to be like dot slash test runner, test file path. That's going to be kind of it, right? <laughs> so maybe three. And say file path. Uh, there must be three arguments. There must be two arguments. Dash dash test followed by a file path. Sure. Why not simply unpack the real mantissa and append the implied one bit if needed, then work on the mantissas? When encoding one can use the MS bit scan instead of the loop and pack appropriately. Right? One can use the most significant bit scan instead of the loop and pack appropriately? I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about, because a mantissa is like 23 bits. So we can't use the most significant bit for anything, because the most significant bit is like the 31st bit. Right? You're right, this isn't an efficient implementation. It's not meant to be. If you, uh, if you want to make it efficient, wait until I, I publish it on GitHub later at the end of the stream, and then you can make a PR. <laughs> Uh, hmm. 
So if string compare argv at one does not equal dash dash test, I guess that's not how that works. That's how that works. So if string compare does not equal zero, we're going to return negative one. We can, I guess we can say why, it doesn't matter. And this is going to be error, first argument must be dash dash test. And this is just a super simple uh, test runner. It's not like a serious anything. Uh, we need a file system. And we're going to create that from rdv at one, rdv at two, excuse me. Okay, and then we're going to start to build this. Add executable. Test runner. Test slash main.cpp. Uh, file glob. How do I do this? I forgot how to do file glob. So file glob test slash. So then we need an out bar, I guess. So this is going to be tests. Test slash test star dot cpp. Why not? So anything test blah, test underscore blah, sure cpp will be in this list and then we can do for each and we can do for each test in glob tests and for each add tests which we can do, give the test a name, which is just going to be whatever the value of the, the file path is. And then command is going to be test runner with, and this can probably be like target file Let me check the intercept CMake to see if I'm doing that one right. It looks like I, I didn't do too bad. And then we have dash dash test test. And check, was there anything else? Command expand lists. Sure. I don't think, I don't know if I need that. Okay. Perfect. No tests were found. That's perfect because we don't have one. And now this is where it gets trickier. Okay. 
let's think about splitting this up into mantissa.h, making this more of a library versus whatever it was before. Gonna need all these includes. This just needs IO stream. Pretty much that's it. Coolio. We should probably do an if and def type of thing. Oh man, Emacs is frozen. Kumar earlier said, I mean the most significant bit set in the Mantissa. I see what you're saying. That does make more sense. And this we're just going to call the Mantissa like main header. Why not? That's not what I meant to do. And we're going to do all that in there. Cool. And then we need to add Hmm. Target. That's why I'm freaking out. Target include directories. I was like, add? We need to add Mantis as source because there's a header in there that it includes now. You know what's funny? We may not have even needed this test runner based on how I built this. Target include directory. Oh, public. Yeah, public. Beautiful. Okay, it's becoming much better. Yeah, I don't think we even needed the uh, the thing, which is quite funny. Because I think I can actually add an executable that refers to this test. Right? With test slash... with that as the source. Something like this. And then I can just run that target file that the executable it produces. Are you against pragma once instead of in if and def? I'm not against it. Uh, I don't prefer it. I don't know. I, there's no reason why. I don't like. I have no logic, but it doesn't feel right. I think a large part of it is like the feeling that I know anything in between the if and def and the end if won't be included, whereas pragma once is like relying on the compiler. So it's just not as like clear to me that it'll work. I know it does work. <laughs> it's just not as clear to me that it will. Gabriel Compute, Jeff Irwin, and Kabichka. Thank you so much for the follows. I appreciate it so much. But yeah, I think I can just do something like this, and I don't even need the test runner. And then let's try writing a test. Uh, let's try this. Uh, 
from float. And we can basically say, binary 32 number is equal to 4.2 F. And then we're going to basically say if number equals 4.2 F, return one. Still says no tests were found, which is interesting. So maybe build testing. I mean, that should be true by default. I just closed a lot of stuff. There we go. I swear there was a testing flag, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Maybe that's another thing I can take a look at. The CMake lists for intercept. If build testing. Oh, I have to include C test. That may be a part of it as well. What have I done? The target name target underscore. <laughs> it's an absolute path. <laughs> okay. It's an absolute path. I just didn't expect that. That's fine. So that means like this naming it that isn't really going to work. Unless it will. Can I just name it an absolute path? I feel like that's asking for a disaster. Cannot specify include directories for target blah, which is not built by this target. Okay. So that didn't work quite all that well. Satchelay says, people will complain, her, it's not best practice. Like, that's okay as long as it works. Yeah, mostly. Jehaxon Meza, thank you so much for the follow. Uh, is there a way to, like, have a number then? How do I get a unique name here? Like, I don't, I don't... CMake unique name. How do I, how do I do this? Generate a GUID in CMake. God, that's that's so horrible. I could use like CMake path, but I don't really want to do that. Can I like use the last eight bytes of the string? I don't know how to do that in CMake. So I think. There's like a string command. Oh God. Right. 
So string prepend append join concat to upper to lower length substring strip gen x strip craziness generation. So you can give it ASCII and a number, configure, make C identifier. Interesting. Random. That's what I want. Can I do this? I can do it into an out bar. Okay. Whoops. There we go. We'll get there. There's got to be a way to get the base name without the full path. Oh yeah, there is. It's called CMake Path. The reason I don't want to use it is because it requires version 3.20, which is quite new and a lot of people don't have that yet. Like I'm requiring 3.14, which is like five years old or something so it's likely people have it already you're right that we don't have to do it this way this seems to have worked though beautiful stuff and it passed and if we say like 4.3 F, we can see it failed. Pog. It'd be great if we could see where it came from. So what do I actually do an intercept then? Because I'm kind of curious. Jeffer wins a pog. Okay, so it looks like I'm just using the actual absolute path as the name of the test in intercept. Oh god, so much stuff is broken. I don't even want to think about it. Okay, I at, le at least it's because I changed stuff. Oh, it's probably not because of that. Uh-oh. <laughs> stuff is broken! <laughs> it's fine. So why can't I do that here? Why is it mad if I just use tests? Or is it not and I just, like, made all this up? It, I feel like I had this before. It says, is reserved or not valid, such as generator expression, may result in undefined behavior. So it's saying the target name is reserved. So is it because it ends in like .cpp or something? Because .int works, so that doesn't work either. So how does it work for intercept to have these as the names of the tests? But it doesn't work here. I don't know what the difference would be, really. They seem almost identical, so who knows? <laughs> who knows what's going on there? Ooh, another thing I just realized is that I screwed that up slightly. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know, I'm not going to think about it too hard, it just seems like it would work. It'd be kind of nice to know which, which one failed, you know what I mean? But uh, I guess that's a luxury we, we can't afford at the moment. Uh, hello? Is it complaining steel? Am I crazy? <laughs> My name Billy says, what are you doing, OS? I'm working on a, a floating point, a custom floating point from scratch. I, I've already done most of it. I was just playing around making a test runner, but now it's really mad at me. Presumably the cache is all messed up.
says is reserved or not valid for certain the target name. So, oh, we're not setting test name. That's why. Burp, burp, burp. Okay, that should fix that. Uh, so, for example, my name Billy. We can, if we go take a look. We can pick two numbers, two floating point numbers from C or C++, and use them to create this custom binary 32 type. We can then print that out in scientific form, which is really all floating point numbers are. And you can see 2.1 here is the same in both cases, 1.049 and blah, 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 times 2 to the 1. We can then sum those, and their sum is equal to 1.049 blah, 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 times 2 to the 2. And the sum here is 4.2, which is just this number, but in decimal notation. And 2.1 plus 2.1 reasonably, it's 4.2. And then here we're doing 2.1 plus 8.1 to test out the different uh, powers, the different exponents and adding those. So this is 1.049 blah 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 times 2 to the 1 and 1.0125 blah 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 times 2 to the 3. The sum of those is 10.2, which makes sense because 2.1 and 8.1 are perfectly that. Quamar says, hey, thanks for inspiring me. I've always wanted to try to figure out a simple floating point emulation as far as plus and minus goes, and I've now also figured out subtraction. Oh, Pog, that's so awesome. I'm so happy to have inspired you. That's the entire goal of this series. So that is, and how do you, this isn't even a series. That's the entire reason I do this. So thank you. I, I do really appreciate that. It matters a lot to know that this is not all for naught. So if we actually look at our test, uh, I mean, we could do like Antissa validate. And then just have something like Mantissa validate condition. And then say if not condition, return negative one. Otherwise, return zero. Call this macro test condition we'd like to ensure from main. And then a tests main, sure. Call this macro the test condition you'd like to ensure from a tests main. And to validate float number does not equal 4.2. So we'd like to validate it does equal that. And we can now run this again. I'm now getting it. So the test name can be anything, but the target name cannot. That's what was getting me. So this name can actually just be test, but this has to have a specific test name. And I think the only reason that works is because we're not creating an executable target from that name in intercept. Whereas we are here, Coolio. So we now test from float. 
can test two float. which is basically going to be float x equals number. Did I screw up something? Oh, I did put a thing there that's not supposed to be. Pog champ. I think I'm going to change this slightly. So that pass or fail is included in name. So we're going to have, oop, not what I meant to do. So I'd like to rename test from float to pass from float.cpp. I'd like to kill test from float and then open pass from float. Okay. Go to the CMake. Pass. We can do passing tests. And then we can do failing tests. Because I believe add test has a way to facilitate this. The given test command is expected to exit with code zero to pass and non-zero to fail or vice versa if the will fail test property is set. How do I set that test property? I don't see it here. So I guess just add will fail. Oh, that doesn't seem right. CMake will generate only if enable here. Uh, add test name command arguments. So can I do? I can get a test property. So maybe I need to set the property. Ah, yes, here it is, test. On the test, test property will, whoop, not sure what happened there, will fail true. Scope may name zero or more existing tests. See also the zero or more. Any amount of tests. So I could like expand this list of failing tests and call this once. That might be better. We'll see. Okay, now we can do a, a failing test. Uh, 
fail to float. I guess we don't necessarily want anything to fail at the moment. Kumar says, the trick is that for subtraction, we'll be, drumroll, subtracting the mantissa instead of adding, assuming unsigned mantissas, which is a big deal, unsigned mantissas. So if the number we're subtracting has a larger mantissa, we simply swap the mantissas and also swap the result sign, so we subtract from the larger one. Ah, so that's what I was going through earlier with the swapping, where I was like, do we need to swap these to make sure the larger one's on the left? We do. That's awesome. Okay, okay. Starting to make sense. Let's start uh, committing this bad boy. In the beginning, there was darkness. Let's create a git repository and shine some light. <laughs> oh, what a great name. Oh, Beaver Fever 95. Thank you so much for the follow. And Kumar, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Beaver Fever. What is a mantissa? A mantissa is a significant of a single precision floating point binary format number. <laughs> Did that help? <laughs> uh, let me help you out. By going through some stuff we went through earlier in the stream, but it's been a few hours. Floating point numbers are basically 2.2, 5.5, right? They can have different, they can have fractions and they're not specifically integers. They are laid out in memory in such a way that they have a sign bit, an exponent, and a significant or mantissa. The significant mantissa coefficient argument fraction or characteristic is part of a number in scientific notation. Scientific notation is basically an exponent and a mantissa, if that makes sense. Hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. So the mantissa is basically this part of a floating point number, which refers to like this part of this actual equation. So one dot mantissa times two to the exponent is the actual value of the floating point number. Beaver Fever, my name always gets a good reaction. Yeah, that makes sense, thanks. Legendary. Is there a way to do this in static scope? Is there static using? Is that a thing? No. Okay, just checking. Well, we have tests now. How about that? Uh, 2.1, 2.1, validate, number 0 plus number 1. How about it? How about it? Wizard Days says, are you working as a freelancer? No, I currently don't work in programming. It's just a hobby. Uh, it didn't pick up the new test because I have to reconfigure CMake. For the file glob to hit. And hey, we got the new test and it passes. So now, like pass add, 
positive, negative. Right, something like that. Or we could do like negative 4.2 and try and get negative 2.1 here. Again, I didn't refresh. Now one failed. Was it failing before and I just missed it? How did I screw the other one up? Pass add two positives. Oh, that's the one I changed, okay. It's now making more sense. And add positive negative just stayed the same, okay. That makes more sense. I was like, what did I do wrong? I did a lot wrong. So now add positive negative is actually add positive negative. Which doesn't pass. So I am curious. What is actually... I, I, I don't have autocomplete and it's killing me. <laughs> Negative 1.54 times 2 to the 2. Which is negative 6.1. This is definitely a leading digit thing. That's probably the subtraction. Negative if signs of the numbers are different, one has to subtract instead. Woo. That's definitely right, though. Just trying to think, man, we can't have an include in that, so it doesn't really work. We'd have to use CMake, which we could. So now what he's getting at, that's probably the subtraction minus if signs of the numbers are different and one has to subtract instead. Yeah, I think that's what's going on, because currently we have this negative handling, but I don't think it's proper because we're kind of just hand, uh, relying on overflow. Yeah, it's not necessarily ideal. I gotta go soon, but I'm, I'm having fun. Uh, so let's just do like 8.31375 and 125. So that should be 10 and a half, right? It's pretty simple. I just want to, I want to see if this works. That works, okay. That's very good. So we can actually add numbers that are like arbitrary. But it, I think, becomes a problem more specifically when we add negative numbers. Yeah. That appears to be it. So there's still plenty to do. Uh -huh. Pass add negative positive. Which is basically just going to be this. Sure. So add 4.2 to negative 2.1 and hopefully get 2.1. Which apparently works. Which is pretty pog. So we can add a negative number. We can add a positive number to a negative number, but we can't add a negative number to a positive number. Lamau. 
and then pass add negatives, please. So I would like to add negative 2.6 to negative 2.4, which should be negative 5.0, right? Oh, uh, I guess I'm not capturing those tests because of the file glob. There we go. So it looks like when one of them is negative, it doesn't work. Otherwise, it's fine. The interesting thing is we're getting the same answer, but one's negative and one's not. So we're getting 6.1 pretty consistently. But it looks to be the fact that this is working. If we go to main.cpp, I'd like to test, actually. So we have a few binary numbers. There's some. We have foo and bar. We have the sum. The float sum. And that's it. That's not what I meant to do, but that's fine. Okay, it does work. That's negative five. Cool. <laughs> cool. I don't know. I didn't realize we could do that, but we can do that, apparently. So two negatives we're cool with, two positives cool with. As soon as you start doing anything in the middle, we get a little shysty. But, you know, we're we doing good. We're doing good. Ugh. So now let's, let's just start. Oh, I, I forgot. I made a git repo and then didn't do anything. <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Don't worry. I'll be out of here soon. Add library mantissa. Can you have a library and an executable that are the same thing? Target include directories mantissa public source. Can even do that. Add executable mantissa like dev or whatever. We'll see if we can just call it mantissas. Uh, we can't. Mantissa dev or whatever. And then we're going to say target link libraries. We would like mantissa dev to be linked with mantissa publicly. And then I think we should do the same here we link it with Mantissa directly. I don't know if that's going to work. It says what? Okay, so there's just some problems with the cache. Okay, there's not just some problems with the cache. What did I do? I think it seems fine. Cannot determine linker language for target. You don't know what language? It's in C++. What do you mean? So it just needs a, a C++ source. 
for some reason. That's fine. Stuff would go here. And it should say it doesn't exist. Thanks, New Shell. Poggers. And now if you wanted to use Mantissa in your project, you just need to write this little ditty in your CMake, this pretty much, in your CMake, and then include Mantissa, and you are good to go. Ain't that cool. I should probably test this will fail thing. Fail test dot cpp int main turn zero. So this should fail. Uh, uh, Alendi, thank you so much for the follow. Okay, it did fail. And then if it actually fails, it should pass. Beautiful stuff. That does work. Okay, I think we can actually now do this. Let's begin with a license. How do you guys feel? You wanna just do the MIT license? Something like that? We cool with that? I think we're cool with that. Beaver Fever, is this for your OS or just because you wanted to make it? Uh, both. I may end up using this in the OS if it goes far and actually gets to a usable place where you can have floats that are usable and like add, subtract, minus, you know, add, subtract, multiply, divide, modulo and conversions between hex, binary, octal, and decimal. If all of those things are possible and implemented, then I'm absolutely most likely going to use it in the OS because in the kernel, most specifically, because the... Uh, floating point numbers using the hardware implementation or even the C implementation in the kernel causes it to allocate XMM registers, SSE registers, vector registers that are used for these floating point uh, instructions on hardware, but it causes the user space data that was actually stored in those registers to be clobbered because on sys calls, we don't save and restore extra CPU feature set registers. <laughs> it's complicated, but basically, possibly. Quamars is probably anything except GPL. I don't think this would be a good candidate for GPL. I will relicense this under the GPL if I feel like I, uh, if I feel like I should. Or if it's going to be start being used in any larger capacity, I'll license it. I'll basically relicense it under the GPL v3 with special uh, notices if it's like an enterprise deal. But that's like way long term if this blows up and becomes a huge thing. Al Lindy says BSD. Maybe the BSD license is what you're referring to. Let's compare it with the MIT. I'm, a, I'm assuming you mean the three clause, which is like the most common. Oh God, where did it go? Those are just all the licenses. The three clause, the most common. Here it is. Must retain the notice must reproduce the note. Well, we don't follow this. So currently I don't want to break my own license. It is a good idea though. That's a fine license. Nothing wrong with it. 
if you, especially for little projects like this, that you just want people to be able to use. Looks good to me. It's free! Bog champ. It's free. <laughs> uh, source. And we're basically just going to, we're just going to include everything in the first commit. We're just going to call it like make a mess. Make a mess. That's what we like doing. Add all the files except for the, you know, the binaries. And then we're going to rename this branch because we're on a bad one. Ooh, that was difficult. Uh, cool. And now let's go make a remote for this so that you guys can access it if need be. new repository, which is going to be Mantissa. Uh, this is an implementation floating point numbers in software. This is meant to be intercompatible with C-style floats. I don't know if that's a word, but uh, I'm going to make it up. Compatible probably is fine. <laughs> uh huh. Beaver Fever says compatible, not intercompatible. Yes. <laughs> uh, we already have a license. We don't need a git ignore template. Create our repository. Beautiful stuff. And now, if you don't know, what you do now is take this and add a git remote, which you could do git remote add, but I'm going to use maggot because I like maggot. And capital M is remote. And then you can see that A is add. Remote name is going to be origin, the default. And then remote URL, is that URL? Set push default, yes. That red update thing is raising my stress levels. <laughs> what red update thing? Wait, what? From barely usable, by the way. First time chat, shoutouts to use. Okay, and then I should, nothing should be here still, perfect. And we should be able to now push to this remote after fetching. Your Chrome needs updating. Oh, this thing. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's true. So we're going to push main to origin main, creating the branch. And then we refresh. Hog champ. It's live. <laughs> we should probably add a readme. I didn't think about that. It's been so long. Uh, Mantissa software floating point library. Mostly, this was implemented for fun and to learn more about the black magic behind uh, behind floating point numbers in C and C++. Mm. 
build tendencies uh, C make a C compiler that's pretty much it a build system too but of course that's kind of uh, obvious Uh, we can link CMake. Uh, a C compiler. Any will do. And a C++ compiler, actually. And from here, first generate a build tree using CMake. Sure. Beaver Fever asks, I still like that name. Do you prefer C++ or C? I don't know. Uh, so I had to answer a text. Uh, do you prefer C++ or C? I prefer C. It depends on what I'm doing, but like if I'm just building, if I'm like writing software that has no time limit, no, no, there's, I'd, I'd write it in C because I like C and it's not confusing. I mean, it's confusing, but it's not like it doesn't sweep the rug out from under you and it doesn't have like weird little limitations that don't make any sense <laughs> and it's not heavy on terminology. Beaver Fever says it's not C++ confusing. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Generator of your choice. Uh, yeah. Then invoke the build tree. Build the library. Tests. Everything else involved with he meant it is a library. Sure. I think that's fine. Using your project uses CMake. Using this library shouldn't be too difficult at all. First, copy the source tree somewhere within your project. It doesn't even matter that it's in the project. First, copy the source tree somewhere locally. Next, call. Then, in your projects, see make lists txt.
add a call to add subdirectory with a path that points to where you and where you keep the local source tree mantissa middle cloud says good morning good morning middle cloud how's it going we love middle cloud give them some love around here if you are in the chat give them a pog champ Whoa. how's it going middle cloud it's good to have you Add subdirectory with a path that points where you keep the local source tree of Mantissa. After this, simply use target link libraries or target public or target public or private. And Tessa. And hashtag include mantissa.h in your source code. We'd like to use it. That should work. If it doesn't, that's fine. <laughs> Middle Cloud says, I just woke up. It is 2 a.m. here. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's It's so late. I'll have to start streaming in the morning some more when it's a better time for you. The morning for me, because for me right now, it is 6. 6.30 p.m. pretty much, so... Uh, I'll have to start doing some better stream times for you. Your West Coast. Yep. Sadly. This looks much better. Beaver Fever, do you have a specific time you stream or just when you feel like it? May well, it's a combination of when I feel like it and when I'm able. So there's definitely no like hard and fast time. By the way, if anybody is not aware of what we were able to get done today, we actually have... What have I done? That's... You see how laggy that was? My mouse was delayed. In case you're just tuning in, what we have done today is we have floating point numbers coming from C, right? So we have these floating point numbers coming from C, 2.1 and 2.1, for example. And then we're adding them using our custom homemade binary32 floating point type which implements IE, IEEE 754, like 1985 floats at the moment, not even that. And we basically add them, and then we're printing out their scientific form. And their scientific form is literally scientific notation, but with base two numbers. So if we take this number, oh, I opened FL Studio, this might get interesting. Uh, yeah, let's close that as fast as possible. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. It didn't like screw up my audio. But if we look up what that number is, you can see it's very close to 2.1 because this is the closest a floating point number can get to 2.1 in binary. And then we sum them, as you can see. And after summing them, we get this number. 2.1 plus 2.1 equals 4.2, very nearly. And that is proven because when we convert it back into a float from C, right, this thing, then we print that out, we properly get 4.2. Bog champ. 
And then we can do the same with adding 2.1 and 8.1, which is a little more complicated because the exponents are not equal, as you can see. But we still end up with 10.2. And then we have uh, two negatives, right? So we have negative 2.4, negative 2.6, and we can add both of those and get negative 5, which is also negative 1.25 times 2 of the 2. Poggers? Poggers, that's what I think. And yeah, we just wrote this all today for funsies. No real reason, but uh, I may end up using this in my OS or in my compiler for the floating point implementations as it can get kind of difficult. I'm kind of curious, do I need C++20? I think I do. No, oh, I don't. Nice. Well, actually, it might just be reading it from the cache. I don't know. I don't think I actually need it. Middle Cloud says, noise. I, I'm glad, I'm glad. But yeah, it's actually really cool to see how they're implemented, of floating point numbers, that is, because it's, it's not simple, but it's also not difficult. <laughs> it's just basic math but it's just basic math repeated times 100. Kumar says, I think I fixed the problem. A new loop after the last while. You're taking the mantissa and moving it all the way to the left. Which only, oh, so if you're subtracting, that matters. Right, Kumar? Yes, renormalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you're referring to is the opposite of this. Right? So when you add two numbers, then they may overflow, and when you subtract two numbers, they may underflow. <laughs> right? The tricky part is that when you subtract two numbers, they may also overflow because negative minus negative is adding. It's difficult. So you need to handle both. But you're correct. You're correct, Quamar. So in subtraction, instead of just flipping the mantissa, so what we were reading from earlier is this silly little kids, <laughs> kids learning thing. I don't know. And uh, it says, rewrite the numbers to have the same power, add or subtract the numbers, the mantises, right? And then rewrite in scientific notation, which is just normalize. But what Quamar is pointing out is that we may end up with a subnormal, or at least a, non, a mantissa with a no leading bit. In which case, we're going to have a big issue Right? Because if there's a mantissa with no leading bit in our final answer, then that means, especially if the exponent is and mantissa are non-zero, that means it's not zero, which means we got past here, right? But that means that effectively, yeah, yeah, so effectively, after we add these two numbers, then we say, for example, let's do 9 plus, 9 plus 4. That equals 13, right? But we don't want to have 13. Well, this is in scientific notation. So these are all times 10 to the 0, right? And we can add 9 and 4, 10 to the 0, and equal times 10 to the 0. But that isn't a normalized number. To normalize this number now, we have to divide mantissa by base, right? This number here, the 10, 13 times 10 to the power. So this is going to be 13 divided by 10, which is going to be equal to 1.3. And then we add one to the exponent. 
which equals 0 plus 1, which equals 1. And then we get 1.3 times 10 to the 1. Because 1.3 times 10 is equal to 13 times 1. So this is what they're talking about, we are talking about when we're saying renormalizing or normalizing numbers. Kumar, Kumar, I don't know how to say your name. pointed out that for subtraction, not only do you have to minus these, when you subtract them, you may end up in a case where you don't even have one point something because you may have, let's say, 8.4 times 10 to the zeroth power minus 8.2 times 10 to the zeroth power which is going to be equal to 0 0.2 times 10 to the 0th power. However, the IEE floating point format requires that the it basically implicitly stores a 1 at the front of the mantissa. <sighs> but there's no 1 there. So this implicit one that's stored would make this 1.2, which is not the same as 0 0.2, right? So then this is the wrong answer. So to properly get the actual right answer of 0 0.2 with a leading one, well, how do we get a leading one here? or a leading digit, I should say, we have to move the decimal point to the right, and in moving the decimal point to the right, that is the same as shifting the mantissa to the left and subtracting one from the exponent. Because now that this number is bigger, 2.0, right? Here, we'll start with this, 0 0.2. And then we can do 0 0.2 times 10 to the 0 is equal to 2.0 times 10 to the negative 1. Because if we multiply 2 by 1 tenth, we get 0 0.2. And that's our answer. Now the tricky part where bit shifting comes into play is in this move. Like how did I actually move this? And the key is that to move this decimal point to the right by one digit, what I had to do was multiply the mantissa by the base, which is 0 0.2 times 10, which equals 2.0, and subtract 1 from the exponent which equals 0 minus 1, which equals minus 1. And that ends up with us here, right? Hopefully that makes sense. And you can see how these are the opposites of each other. And that makes sense that we have to do the opposite when adding and subtracting. And when you add two numbers, floating point numbers, they already have that leading one set. So because the leading one is already set, there's no chance that there isn't a digit here. Because 0 0.5 and 0 0.4 are not valid floating points because there's a leading one. So they have leading ones and are stored in that way, which means because we've done this step, we don't actually have to handle that here, which is kind of confusing, right? But it's it's kind of nice. Change those back to whatever they were. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense that we actually need to do this type of thing when we subtract. So not only does this operation have to be different, also I don't think the signed way we're doing things here is right anyway, so don't worry about that. But we get the left mantissa, the right mantissa, we add them, and then we shift by normalizing. But when we subtract them, we have to get the left mantissa, right mantissa, subtract them, and normalize the other way after normalizing this way. 
That way we get that leading digit and we can properly continue to operate on them and assume the proper thing. Whew. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyways, I think we could get into that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait because I don't, I'm not confident that I can finish that if I start it. I do have to go, otherwise I will not see the end of it. So thank you everybody so much for watching. Be sure to check this brand new software floating point library implementation out on GitHub. You can, uh, use it for yourself pretty much with anything because of the MIT license. You are free to do anything except sue me. So do that. <laughs> do anything except sue me. I, pro I, I encourage you. <laughs> but yeah, be sure to check this out. Check out Intercept on GitHub as well. This is my compiler which is basically, it's, it's shaping up. It's getting a lot better, I would say. Uh, because, uh, mainly, we now have passing of complex parameters. So, for example, if we take a look really quick in here, can take a look at tests and param passing or whatever. So many tests. Uh, but yeah, we can now like, what is it? What did I call it? I call it complex params. I cannot remember. Array param, there it is. So for example, in intercept, this is probably going to be better to look at locally and thinking about it because I have syntax highlighting. Uh, load file. Da -da. There we go. Kumar says, I saw one stream. Absolutely insane. Also the sys5 ABI, no comment. <laughs> Passing structs and registers and stuff. Exactly. Yep, that's all implemented now. We've done that. Kumar says SSA, register allocation and stuff like that. Just wow. Yep, it's a compiler. It works, it works. But yeah, as you can see here, we can pass a an array of two integers they're each eight bytes so this is a 16 byte type as a parameter and then use it within the function to return an integer and this whole thing returns 69 and it works even on linux and uh if we take a look at this Beautiful stuff. Lots happening. Uh, but yeah, if we take a look at this, I think I would have to do something like this. And then I can look at code.s. But yeah, if we take a look at code.s, we can see that uh, I didn't annotate the code. We can see that in this IR comment, there are two parameters passed, two arguments passed to this function foo. One of them is in RSI, one of them one of them is in RDI, right? However, foo only takes one parameter. And this is because of the sys5 structs and registers type of thing. And it causes a whole bunch of extra, of extra copies right now, <laughs> just because of how things are ordered and register allocation. So there's actually like the array here 
but then this gets copied into the stack of the caller uh, here, right? So it gets copied into this copy on the stack of the caller. And then after doing the call and setting all the, uh, the arguments up, right? Then we do the call. And in the call, <laughs> we make another copy on the stack. And then we, uh, we copy from the parameters that we got into there. And then we have to copy that once more just because of an implementation detail. And then we copy that again because uh, we we're just being stupid. There's a million copies right now because of sys5 requiring registers to local, local to local, and then <laughs> it's a mess. You can see that there is three copies <laughs> in this one function. Well, technically two copies, but three if you count getting it from the registers here. Whew. Anywho, that's how the that's how the compiler's going. It's going well. You should check it out. I recommend it. Kumar says, oh. Uh, oh, Kumar says, I wrote a scripting language that does simple just-in timing, but the resulting assembly is trash. Still much faster than Python, though. Pog. Anything is faster than Python. Let's be real. Kumar says, oh, and your language supports function overloads, I see. So that's name mangling. Yep. We do have overloads. There's all sorts of tests for it. So you can have a simple overload like this where you pass an integer or a pointer to an integer and get different values out. Or you can have a little more of a complicated overload where it becomes more difficult to figure out which one is which. Yeah? But all of these are working, at least. Okay, this one isn't working right now <laughs> for some reason. But it's because I just uh, changed some stuff and didn't... Uh, look over it too much, which you can tell in the PR. There's like two commits that are separated by like four days from everything else. Yeah, these two. <laughs> added 10 commits two weeks ago, added two commits two days ago. These screwed everything up, so don't worry about the, the failing tests. We'll get there. But yeah, we have function overloads. It's It's complicated, but it does work well. You know? Because the best part is you can pass an overloaded function as a parameter to an overloaded function. <laughs> oh, nice. Most people writing new languages use LLVM ugh, backend, so having a handmade code gen is super impressive. Thank you. It's all on YouTube if you want to watch me write it. <laughs> It's all there, baby. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I can't stand LLVM or like... I don't feel like that's really making your own programming language in a full sense. It's making a front end for the LLVM programming language, which is fine. You can make a different syntax for that language as much as you want, but it's not going to change what the language is and what it feels like, or the code that it generates, or etc., right? And I also have an OS. You should check that out on Codeberg. Links below. Be sure to check that out in the About section. In the OS, we've been doing a bunch of networking. Recently, we just got packets actually sending and receiving packets over the network. Not even truthfully packets, I should say frames. But it doesn't matter because you can put in, you can put a packet in the frame and then it's a packet. Anyway, Lenser OS is doing well. We just recently I've been working on implementing sockets and the whole logic behind sockets. And you can see, look, we can echo boggers. Wow. Ooh. We can run a child shell that runs echo. 
we can run uh, pwd, get the process working directory. We get all this stuff. And in the background, you can see that when it was starting up, we sent a packet, a packet transmitted. And this packet actually refers to an ARP request, an ARP address resolution protocol request, which basically asks, hey, I know that this IP exists. Can If you have this IP, can you give me your MAC address back? And then we're actually receiving a packet. And this packet is of ether type 0806, which is actually the ether type for ARP. So we're getting a reply packet to our ARP and it's sending it back to us because this is our Mac. If we take a look up here, we can see that our Mac address is 52, 54, 98, 76, 54, 32, right? And that is what we have down here, 52, 54, 98, 76, 54, 32. So we are correctly uh, embedding our MAC address, our virtual MAC address, into the ARP request and getting a message back. Buggers. I saw that mentioned in another stream as well, another super impressive accomplishment. Thank you. It's, it's going really well. I'm having a fun time with it. And uh, I'd love any help I can get. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, I remember setting up GDT, IDT, and stuff back in the 386 days, but that's like 20 years in the past. Don't remember anything anymore. CR0, CR3 for page table, I guess. Yeah. No idea how modern X64 CPUs, let alone multiple cores, work on the lowest level. Anyway, huge respect. Thank you so much, Komar. I appreciate it. Uh, to answer a few things there. CR3 is still the page table. Everything's still the same from the 386 days. However, some things are different because there are some new segments in the GDT and like CS, the, the segment registers are no longer used for memory segments. They're used for like thread local storage and for, I'm sure as they were before, for ring permissions with like the data segment and code segment. So they're not actually used anymore for memory addressing, but they are used for like random stuff. <laughs> but overall, if like if we looked at the uh, Lenser OS boot in the kernel, a stage one, it's pretty much exactly what you just described. <laughs> we have uh, set up the GDT, set up the IDT, <laughs> right? We do a little bit, a little bit craziness because we set up physical memory managers, virtual memory managers, a heap. We have the UART driver so that we can actually print uh, to the terminal output, which is how we're seeing everything here. And then we create a system, real time clock driver. We draw brute graphics. We have a keyboard handler so that we can take input from the user in the kernel. We have random number generators. We have this feature set of the CPU using CPU ID, which means like, ah, CPU ID is supported. And if CPU ID is supported, then we can check, ah, is register D of CPU ID actually have the EDX FX save and restore bit set? And if the FX save and restore bit is set, then we set the system CPU as FX save and restore capable. And then we set up a memory region so that we can save the FX. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff, and that's halfway. We also probe, we do all the PCI enumeration and ACPI table setup, like FADT and stuff. We probe storage devices to find AHCI controllers. We probe AHCI controllers to find partitions, and then we probe AHCI controllers, HCI ports, and HCI partitions to detect file systems that we know that we have drivers for. Once we do that, we initialize the PIT, the, a timer. And then we uh, set up the network E1000 device. We set up the scheduler. We set up the VFS. We set up the init process with the graphical frame buffer information. There's so much. Kumar says, ah, the pit, that's still a thing? Yep, <laughs> it's legacy, but it's still supported the API and everything on modern CPUs. 
technically you don't need the pit anymore, but most of the times it's, it's still used. If we look at the OS dev page for it, you can check it out. But yep, we're still using the pit. It's made in the 70s and it works great. <laughs> There's probably a, a better system clock that we could use, but it's, it's fine. It's a great one. Especially when you have real-time clock for real-time stuff. But yeah, we're still using the pit. We're still remapping the exception interrupts up to OX20 or 32. It's all still the same, pretty much. <laughs> Kala, Kayla says, Hi, I would not use LLVM2. Nice. It's definitely more difficult. It's not like the easy way to do things by any means, right? But for me, it's so much more important that I know that I learn how these things work. Kumar says, out OX20, OX20. Yeah, that's for IOQ, IRQ 0 through 7 sending EOI, baby. You know what confused me for a long time? This is kind of random, but in the kernel source, pick EOI is OX20. So when you send end of interrupt, you send OX20, but pick one command is also OX20. <laughs> uh, Kumar says out OXA0 OX20. Yep, that's what you do for, you're basically describing, I think, what's in here as end of interrupt. This thing. Kumar says IRQ8+. plus. Yep, pretty much. The trick is you have to send the end of interrupt to the main, the, like, uh, parent pick, as well as the child pick. Because the child pick is actually cascaded through interrupt IRQ2. So this interrupt is triggered on the parent pick, and then it triggers an interrupt on the child pick. And then you have to end the child pick interrupt and then end the parent pick interrupt. It's a mess, but at least it's working well. <laughs> this is good. Dead beef boob face. <laughs> Oh, and setting up DMA. That was a nightmare as far as I remember, Lamau. Do you have to do you have anything like this today as well? <laughs> Pretty much everything is DMA. So, yep, we have DMA out the wazoo. Like it required physical memory page. Yeah. You know the cool thing about the uh the Lenser OS kernel is it has identity mappings. So, physical memory is easy to deal with as it should be in the kernel. But yeah, it's all identity mapped, so it's, we, we good. <laughs> we good, fam. I can show you in the driver. For example, the E1000 driver, which we've been working on recently on stream. Uh, request pages. Uh, okay, so you map all the physical memory to match the virtual addresses. Uh, the other way around, but yeah. But as you can see, I just use my physical memory manager to request uh, pages. And then this, I can just get the physical pointer exactly like this. And then I can just write to this pointer and not, not have to worry about anything. And the same thing here for the TX descriptors. And then the same thing when we actually write something to get a... This is no longer a memory leak, by the way. To get a... We just, to write pages, we get a physical address by requesting some. 
new ones and copying into there. It's pretty easy. I, I do like the identity mapping. It's not easy to maintain, though. It, there's a bunch of issues. The hardest part is loading a user space process and dealing with that stuff, but it's pretty easy. And uh, one eventually, if for like security reasons or otherwise, the, OA, the kernel needs to actually not have identity mapping, it'd be really easy to have memory request pages, right? Just return like, the physical address plus OX random number, 75 blah 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 blah, right? Or some, it has to be aligned, I'm sure. Just plus some random offset that's the same everywhere. And then we could just have like, uh, when we actually need to use, like store the physical address, we could just subtract this because request pages is returning that, the physical address plus this to get the virtual address, which is called offset. Uh, linear offset mapping as far as I know. But linear mapping is fine uh, for for now, forever. I don't plan on changing it unless it's a, a huge deal security-wise or other or, any, or anything like that. But it should be fine because if anything is able to get the kernel to like read or write to a physical address that doesn't look like a user space address, then that's kind of the kernel's fault. Because in all the syscalls and stuff, we have validate pointer, right? We aren't doing it because we're not worried about security right now. But within each process, that's not the right place to go. Within each process, we have a list of memories, which is memory regions, right? It's like what the process remembers. I like thinking of it as its memories. Oh, but we have a list of memories and each memory region Whoops. Each memory region has its virtual address and physical address. And because of that, that means that it's actually quite easy when we receive an address in a syscall to just loop through the regions and say, is it within one of these virtual address ranges? And if it's not, then it's not a valid pointer for this process and we deny we deny it. So like we're gonna it's we're doing pretty good as far as security goes. There's a it's obviously not anywhere near perfect because it's a hobby OS built by one person mainly, so if you're expecting perfection, this ain't it, chief, but <laughs> but it works, you know what I mean? The, it runs, it opens. Sorry if that was loud, my phone just vibrated. Uh, Komar says, sure, but still pretty amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. It doesn't feel amazing. It feels like everything's broken and, I, <laughs> and it barely works. But to be fair, that's how like Windows feels. So <laughs> Komar says, I remember writing a DOS extender in the old days. Back then there were no virtual machines. Ugh. I don't even know how that'd be possible. Enter protected mode, ring zero, and crash graciously. <laughs> that is something we're good at in Linzer OS. We crash pretty gracefully. Most of the time when we're triple faulting, it's because QEMU has a bug. Or we have a horrid uh, bug that is like UB, but that doesn't happen often. Komar says reboot and continue. <laughs> Rebooting is easy, but shutting down is hard. <laughs> you know what I mean?
Alrighty. Kumar says no. <laughs> Sorry if I was just silent. I got uh, to go <laughs> at some point. Uh, Kumar. But yeah, basically the, the, the difficulty with reboot, and if you don't know, reboot is this easy. It's not difficult, right? You just write to some memory, either MMIO. You just write to some MMIO and you're fine. But to do a shutdown, guess what? <laughs> it's not like that. The AC. PI shutdown is technically a really simple thing. All that is needed is a write to some address with some value. And the computer's powered off. Simple as. The problem lies in the gathering of these values, especially since sleep type A, this thing here, is in the slash underscore S5 object, which is in the DSDT and therefore AML encoded. AML encoded. Do you know what AML is? If you don't, it's a language. <laughs> it's, it's an entire language. So ASL is ACPI source language. It is more human readable form of the byte code that is AML, right? This difference is similar to that between assembly code and machine code. Yeah, so this is ASL. And then that can be compiled into AML, which is less, not like human readable. And then that AML is stored on computers. In this language, we're going to need a way to interpret AML and figure out these devices and objects. Yeah. And methods. And we have to get these from the DSDT, parse the AML, like where to actually find it in memory, and then disassemble it, right? Or basically interpret it as we go. There's luckily there's only, you know, 250 instructions, operations. So it'll be quick to implement, luckily. <laughs> and there's such simple to understand operations as string and scope, and package, and method, and dual name, and multi name, and external operator, and mutex. Mutex! <laughs> Middle Cloud says, I was using AML for an old project called Alice, which was used for egg drop bots for IRC. Pog. Was that the same AML? Like more than 12 years ago in Lua slash TLC. F. Lua moment. Kumar says that's crazy. But yeah, this is what uh, what I have to do if I want to be able to shut down the PC. So it's going to take a little bit. And of course, if I wasn't so stubborn, we could just use Akpika, which is like an implementation by Intel, pretty much, of the ACPI AML language. But I'm not into that. I'm not really into that, you know? I'd like to create my own my own OS and not use everybody else's code, which means we will be using the internal AML interpreter, which doesn't exist yet. <laughs> we'll get there. But yeah, that's how the OS is going. I think I was meaning, meaning to end the stream at some point, but I didn't. Uh, I guess I shouldn't be closing everything yet because I still have to add stuff in the uh, description. I'm gonna add this in the description. Not this, not this, 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 and the one before this. And before that, the one before that, this. Perfect. Middle Cloud says AIML is basically the initial version of GPT, is like the dumb brother of GPT. I don't know what that is. What do you mean, GPT? GUID partition table? 
Kumar says, that's probably something else then. That's almost definitely something else then, yes. When I heard egg drop bots, I was like, eh, I don't think so. Uh, but yeah, GPT is definitely, I don't know what that may stand for, other than GUID partition table. GPT model in machine learning. Chat GPT? Oh my god. <laughs> We're not interested in AI here. <laughs> not that type of AI. I'll do anything in my power to just write code. <laughs> Please write your own code. It's not hard. I mean, it is hard, but that's what you're here for. Okay. Yep, that's me done. Uh, be sure to check out the, the links in the description down below, as well as in the about section if you are on Twitch. They will link you to my GitHub, where you can find this brand new floating point software implementation, interoperable with C-style floats. That's the word I was thinking of, interop, before. You can find my compiler, which has now references and compiler, and uh, yeah, compile time, uh, type checking, a static type that's uh, completely custom language is Pog. Go check it out. I've got a bootloader. I've got a, an OS, which uh, I work on a lot. It's got over a thousand commits. It's just over a year old, and I would love your help on it because there's so much to do. So be sure to, uh, if you're interested, check it out. There is always more to do. Check out the description for any of these resources that we used in today's stream and uh, scream at me in the comments if there's a resource I am forgetting. Uh, yeah. Be sure to check out the Discord link as well if you would like announcements every time I go live. You will never miss another stream of mine again, boggers. But yeah, so be sure to join the Discord. We love you here. We'll have a fun time. You can talk about just programming in general, drop memes and off topic or whatever you want. Talk about linguistics and pronunciation and spelling and linguistics. Get code review to see how bad did you write? How bad is the code you wrote? You could, you could get all sorts of help, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of entertainment from the Discord. Be sure to join it. From the Discord, you can also access uh, my YouTube, by the way. And my YouTube, you can actually find every single VOD and every single video, every single stream I've ever done. So those are all up on the internets for you to watch. All eight days of me working on the compiler is up there. So if you're interested in that stuff, check it out. Uh, Middle Clouds is... Kumar says goodbye. I have to ask, what is Pog, though? <laughs> Pog is like uh, a face. It's like, oh, oh, whoa, yeah, oh my god, what, oh, you know, it's like that. It's like, wow, what, insane, you know, it's like, what, is like mind blown moment. It's this face. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right, oh. It's like a no way. Amazing. <laughs> this is what is Pog. Pog is face. <laughs> I like the bubble. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> Middle Cloud says goodbye unless you're sleeping. Oh, thanks. Uh, no, I still got stuff to do. I gotta be awake. Middle Cloud says, like, lol. <laughs> exactly, like, lol. Sort of. <laughs> stands... <laughs> stands for pissing on ground. No, I don't know. <laughs> Laughing out loud, pissing on ground. You know, lol, pog. Twitch chat is crazy. <laughs> pissing on ground. <laughs> <laughs> So you're gonna start telling people pog stands for <laughs> why do you why do you say pog all the time ah it stands for pissing on ground <laughs> uh, that's so dumb 
I can totally see that being real, though. <laughs> Just another abbreviation. Kids these days. <laughs> G Montana, thank you so much for the follow. But yeah, check out my YouTube. Check out the GitHub. Check out the Codeberg. Check out everything. Be sure to join the Discord and be a part of this lovely community. We'd love to have you. And uh, everyone, if you are still here, give a shout out, a pog, a pog champ to Middle Cloud, our most recent contributor. We love Middle Cloud. We love all of you viewers here, but Middle Cloud is the most recent one to keep this channel going, make it easier for me to justify spending this much time, you know, just sitting here on a computer. So I appreciate it. I have had so much fun talking with all of you. Thank you for coming out, and I hope that you learned something today about how floating point numbers operate and work. Uh, beyond that, I don't think I have anything left, so as I've pointed you to the links already, go click those links, click the links now, now click those links, click the follow button, click the, click the subscribe button. If somebody clicks the follow button right now, I'll be at 420 followers on Twitch, which is kind of beautiful to end a stream on 420 followers, right? <laughs> if we can get that one extra follow, if you're here right now, press that button and we will have the most glorious ending to this stream in the world. <laughs> Your name will go down in history, the 420th follower of the first platoon of Lenzer. <laughs> Kumar says 420 at 420 oh. that's right alternatively nobody follow for the next nine days <laughs> then somebody follow then we'll be 420 followers on 420 and that would be pog that would be a pog champ right there <laughs> so yeah nobody follow for nine days or follow right now <laughs> I'm just messing with y'all. Be sure to click the buttons, do the things. You guys have heard it all at this point. Thank you so much for coming out. I really enjoy hanging out with you all. You're so positive. You're so amazing. I have a fun time with y'all. So, uh, yeah. Be sure to stay tuned. Stay in the Discord. Check out the announcements. You'll never miss another live stream. I'll see ya. I'll see ya, folks. Bye-bye.